the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability is now in session. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I welcome everybody who uh, is uh, in, present in the hearing room or who uh, will be following the proceedings on the live stream. This is the fourth day of our hearing uh, being conducted at the Park Royal Hotel in Parramatta. And uh, we are focusing on the experiences of people with disability who've been homeless or at risk of uh, homelessness. And over the next uh, couple of days, uh, we will be having a particular look at uh, the operation of uh, houses in Victoria, boarding houses known as Supported Residential Services or SRSs. We'll commence uh, with uh, the acknowledgement of country. And on behalf of the Commission and the Commissioners, I wish to acknowledge the Darrett people, the traditional custodians of the land upon which this hearing is taking place. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We also pay our respects to all First Nations people who may be attending the hearing in person today, uh, as well as those who uh, are following the proceedings on the uh, live stream. Yes, Ms. Beck. Yes, Commissioners. The second part of public hearing 26 will examine supported residential services or SRSs in Victoria. Commissioners, most publicly supported housing in Victoria is provided in the form of public and community housing, which provides accommodation to about 20,000 people who receive the disability support pension, that being 40% of all rebated tenancies. We're told that a further 2,000 homes accompanied by support for Victorians with mental illness will be delivered by the end of this year. In addition, there are 5,500 operational places for res residential aged care services provided as part of the public sector residential aged care service. Residents in this category, commissioners, are intended to be over 65 years of age. The Australian government strategy, younger people in residential aged care strategy is aimed at ensuring that no person under 65 lives in residential aged care, absent exceptional circumstances. Separately, People with a disability can access specialist disability accommodation or SDA, being accommodation for people with extreme functional impairment or high support needs. Outside these broad categories, commissioners, there are supported residential services. SRSs are privately owned and operated facilities that provide accommodation and support for people who require assistance with everyday living, including people with disability. They are intended, Commissioners, to offer a supported accommodation option for people who need some support but are not eligible for or able to access government-funded accommodation. Most SRSs are known as pension level. That is, SRSs which charge fees based on the current rate of pension plus the amount of Commonwealth rent assistance. This is usually between 85 to 95% of the resident's pension plus 100% of the Commonwealth rent assistance. This equates to fees of between $900 to $1,000 per fortnight. We understand, Commissioners, that there was a sharp decline in the number of pension level SRSs in Victoria between the years of 1997 and 2005 with more than 1,500 beds in the sector lost in that period. I say beds rather than rooms, commissioners, because many people living in SRSs are required to share rooms. Poor financial viability was cited as the main reason for that decline. We understand there are currently 114 registered SRSs in Victoria with capacity to provide accommodation to 4,000 people. At the time of a census and resident experience survey carried out in 2018, 79% of SRS residents had a disability, including a psychosocial disability. The Victorian government provides $13.6 million of funding to SRSs each year to pension level SRSs through two funding programs, the Supported Accommodation for Vulnerable Victorians initiative known as SAVI a funding source that was introduced in 2006 to assist the viability of pension level SRSs 
or the Pension Level Project or PLP funding, which supports pension level SRSs that don't receive savvy funding. That funding is, is intended to assist in capacity building or standards improvement. Commissioners, SRSs operate under the Supported Residential Services Private Proprietors Act of 2010 and the Supported Residential Services Private Proprietors Regulations of the same of 2012. SRSs can only be registered where the secretary or their delegate registers the premises having decided that the building site is suitable and the applicant or each director or other officer that exercises control over the applicant is suitable to and has the relevant skills and knowledge to operate that SRS. Once registered, the SRS can receive residents. Each resident must have a written agreement with the proprietor and an interim support plan within 48 hours. An ongoing support plan must be in place within 28 days. The proprietor must consult with the resident about the content of that support plan and identify ongoing health and personal support needs of the resident and the supports that will be provided to the resident to assist with those needs. Importantly, commissioners, the proprietor must ensure that a resident support plan is carried out as prepared. Failure to do so carries substantial penalties. Although you, as you will hear in the 12 years that SRS legislation has been in place, there's been no successful prosecution under the SRS Act and only very recently has the first prosecution been initiated. There must, under the legislation, be one staff member for every 30 residents at an SRS. They must be appropriately trained, which is at least a certificate three or four level qualification. The SRS must maintain, must deliver the minimum standards set out in the regulations including requirements around independence and choice, protection from abuse, standards of food, safety and cleanliness. There are questions, commissioners, about whether the qualifications, capacity and staffing levels are sufficient to provide the supports required by the SRS Act and regulations. Those questions will be explored at a systemic level through witnesses like Bell. Bell's been a resident of an SRS for a number of years. Her, her ongoing support plan currently states, quote, she needs staff to do her laundry twice per week. Her room is always very messy. Needs staff to spend time to tidy and organize room every day. Her bed sheet needs changed every second week. Her room also needs to be vacuumed twice per week. The commissioners will find that plan at bundle B3 at tab 25. Now, commissioners noting that Bell could choose to refuse people to allow, to allow people into her room and recalling that this is not a hearing where we are calling upon this Royal Commission to make specific findings of fact. The photographs taken in Bell's room just last month cast some doubt upon whether those obligations are taken as seriously as they might be. The operator might show document ending 0006 which is recently been tendered as exhibit two. This is the recent state of Bell's room. Another photograph, Your Honor, of the same room at 0003 exhibit one shows the same room from another angle. People with a disability living in an SRS may also receive funding under the National Disability Insurance Scheme. The NDIS Insurance Agency in, um, estimates around 1,600 NDIS participants live in SRSs. The average annual plan budget for these participants is $128,000 per participant. For example, Bell, whose room the commissioners just saw, uh, has an NDIS package, uh, which includes core supports. And the commissioners will find that at tab 18 of B3. 
Those core supports include funding to assist you with your daily personal care needs, domestic tasks and financial management. Records provided to the Royal Commission suggest that under her previous plan, more than $63,000 was spent on Bell's behalf as assistance with daily life. And the commissioners will find that accounting tab, B, tab 19 of folder B3. This substa these substantial funds expended on assistance with self-care was charged by an NDIA service provider. That service provider has the same operating address as the SRS and has directors in common with the SRS where Bell resides. Commissioners, these raise obvious questions as to who is regulating the proper provision of the services and whether there are any issues arising from this method of organising the provision of supports. These questions are magnified, Commissioners, when we see the state of another SRS, Hamilton House, an administrator appointed last year to that was appointed last year, commissioners, and this is what they found if the operator would show the document ending in 0094. And commissioners, this is exhibit three. I'll ask the operator to zoom in on the photographs. And I'll ask the operator to slowly scroll through those photographs. Commissioners, we will examine what, if any, arrangements exist for monitoring the potential for overlap between the services under these dual arrangements, what steps are taken to ensure that residents are not paying twice for the same service or paying twice and receiving no service at all. A central question that is likely to emerge from this evidence is whether the current pension level SRS model is financially viable and adequate to meet the care and support needs uh, of the people who live in these facilities, having regard to the level of care and support required by the cohort of people accessing SRS support, the prescribed minimum resident to staff ratio being 30 to one, and the prescribed minimum qualifications, skills, and experience of the staff. I'll pause there and ask the operator to bring down the photographs. In order to provide the required level of services to residents, SRS proprietors must maintain occupancy rates and find alternative sources of income or opportunities to cross subsidize in a wider organization. Commissioners, does this encourage proprietors to cut corners or otherwise fail to comply with the requirements of the SRS regulatory regime? These issues may present risks to SRS participants. The pressure to maintain occupancy rates could encourage an SRS to accept a pr prospective resident without properly considering their care and support needs and the ability of staff to meet those needs. Or if a person will fit with the existing residents. The objectives of the SRS Act and the SRS regulations to protect the safety and wellbeing of residents living in is to protect the safety and wellbeing of residents in SRSs. The risks posed to residents by proprietors who fail to comply with the regulatory regime or cut corners are obvious. Provision is made within the legislation for a series of escalating compliance and enforcement mechanisms. The Royal Commission will hear evidence about these mechanisms and the circumstances in which they are deployed. The evidence may suggest that there is a tension or a balancing exercise between taking effective compliance and enforcement action in the face of non-compliance and acknowledging the role SRSs presently play in providing accommodation to people who might otherwise be homeless. 
And the fundamental question arises, has the right balance been struck? The rollout of the NDIS is an example of an alternative revenue stream. A number of SIRS proprietors or entities related to those proprietors now operate as registered or unregistered NDIS providers. In that capacity, the NDIS providers deliver NDIS funded supports and services to SRS residents, which can bear a striking resemblance to the services an SRS provider is also required to provide. Community visitors, the public advocate and others have expressed concern about the lack of transparency and the potential for conflict of interest in these dual arrangements. Concerns have also been expressed about the impact the dual arrangements may have on the services provided to residents and their capacity to exercise choice and control. The Royal Commission will hear from four witnesses with lived or direct experience of SRSs, including one witness who currently lives in an SRS and one who only very recently transfer transferred to supported independent living accommodation. We will shortly begin commissioners with evidence from Denise. And while the audio recording plays, you'll see a slideshow displaying some photographs of Denise. She lived at Hamilton House for a number of years and she will tell you about that experience, including about the COVID-19 outbreak in August of 2020 and her subsequent evacuation. We will then hear from Kate um, Rice, the General Manager Home Support and, at uh, Winteringham and Brian Lippman AM, the CEO at Winteringham. Winteringham operate a number of programs, including outreach, social housing, in-home aged care, residential aged care, and a registered pension level SRS. In addition to operating its own pension level SRS, it has been engaged to provide services to the residents or former residents of other SRSs. On the basis of this direct experience and many years experience in the sector, these representatives of Winteringham will give evidence about the care and support needs of people who live in an SRS. They will say, Commissioners, it's not possible to properly operate a pension level SRS in a financially viable and responsible manner. We'll then hear from Jacob, a 60 year old man. Um, he, resi he resided in the same SRS for five years. Jacob will tell you about his experiences of living in that SRS. He was still living there when Winteringham took over the day-to-day -day running of the facility. Winteringham worked with Jacob and his support team to find a new secure SIL accommodation where he resides now. Jacob misses the community of his former SRS and would be happy to move back there with a new proprietor providing support as Winteringham did this year. Belle will give evidence this afternoon she has an intellectual and psychosocial disability and has lived in several SRSs over the past six years. Belle is also an NDIS participant and we've already shown you the photos of her bedroom last month. Tomorrow morning, the Royal Commission will hear from Georgia. Georgia's mother, Kay, was a resident of an SRS at the time of her death. Georgia made a complaint to the Victorian government about her care, the care her mother received at the SRS and the circumstances surrounding her death. After making a complaint, Georgia felt like she could not get information about what would happen next. Dr. Colleen Pierce, AM, the public advocate in Victoria, will give evidence this afternoon. Dr. Pierce will address key themes relating to the regulation and oversight of SRSs. And on Friday, we turn to the government witnesses. Over the course of three sessions, the Royal Commission will hear from Tracy McNay, the National Disability Insurance Scheme Quality and Safeguards Commissioner, and Samantha Taylor, PSM, Strategic Advisor to the NDIS Commission as a panel. Anthony Colmus, the Director of Human, Human Services Regulator Unit in the Victorian Department of Families, Fairness and Housing, will give evidence about the regulatory framework that applies to SRSs and what approach has been adopted by the state in that space. Sherry Bruinhout, the Executive Director of Homelessness Housing Support Homes in Victoria, 
will give evidence about the way in which state government funds SRSs and raises questions about the overall viability of the model. Throughout the government witnesses, we'll examine the regulatory quality and safeguarding arrangements that apply to SRSs and NDIS providers, identifying gaps in the arrangements and asking where the responsibility lies for filling that gap. Um, Commissioners, just before we play the evidence of Denise as a pre-record, I'm told that there is an appearance to be announced for one of the parties with leave to appear. <coughs> yes, if there's any additional appearance, now is the time to announce that appearance. On, on the record, uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Mulambwe, Initial T, Solicitor for GTC Lawyers, appear on behalf of Grace Disability Services. Yes, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Commissioners. We'll now ask that um, the evidence of Denise be played. <coughs> So just so people know when the judges listen so they know who it is, I'm Kathy and I'm here with Denise today and she wants to share her story about where she used to live. That's right, isn't it, Denise? Yeah, yeah. And what you're going to tell us now, this is the truth, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Now, I, I call them the judges. That's the, the commissioners. That's who you mean, isn't it? Yeah. So do you want to tell the judges about what it was like to live in Hamilton House? Maybe with a real cold. Real cold. Yeah. And the bed and, and the door, hit the bed. The, the, We're so close to a door, door and it's hit the bed. We're so close to a door, what's the hell? What's close, close to a door? Yeah. And, hit it. yeah. and so why was it cold? Do you remember, like, was there a heater? You know, what's the only, you know, only, only one heater, only one heater, only one Yeah. Only one. And what about the back door? The back door was open all night. All night? Yeah. And, and why night. was it open? Yeah, because uh, someone had broke, broken me up. And it stayed broken for a yeah. long time. Yeah, and he cut open, he cut something because he was open all night. God, I was so afraid in there. I thought that someone was going to come in and kill me. Yeah. Terrified. Yeah. Terrified. Yeah, it was frightening. And you had a room, a bedroom for yourself? Yeah, I had a bedroom for myself. Yeah. But you had to share the bathroom? Yeah. And what was the bathroom like? Oh, it was just cold. Cold? Oh, it's nice. I was sick there the whole time. I'd be sick. Oh, all the time, I'd be sick there. And do you want to tell the Royal Commission, the judges, about your bedroom? So you said it was little. Uh, yeah, I could so, say open the door and shut the door. And then when I open it again, it's went, uh, went next to a bed. Yep. What went next to a bed? What did you have in your room? So you had your bed and? And, and a wall wave to put our, to put a coast in and to put our bits and pieces in there. And, and did, that's all we had. And what about, did you have a cot for your do, for your dolls? Yes, I had a cot for my dolls. You had a cot for your dolls. And tell the Royal Commission, tell the judges about your dolls, like your babies. Oh, my babies were not a good little thing. A darling little mind. I, I destined myself. I yeah. destined yeah. and I bastard myself. Yeah. And I, I feed me. And I saw, and he goes to sleep. Well, a wonderful doll, he, uh, a brand new one for a baby born. And you see, you put all down, you see, you go fast to see, you coat the eyes. And what happened to your babies when you lived at Hamilton House? I oh, see for one all out. And a woman, yeah, she for one all out because we had, the, we had bed bugs in the, in the bed and was biting me all over. Right. Stuff them. And did she tell you she was going to throw them out? No, no, she didn't say anything until I come home and he was there. Because the man was there. Yeah. A man was there and he was cleaning the floor, cleaning the, cleaning something out. He only had one cleaner there 
for China was seeking them, everyone. So when COVID happened, you had to move out of Hamilton House. Do you want to tell the judges where you went to? Mm -hmm. Where did you go when the flu was on and you left Hamilton House? Yeah, I went to a, I went to a, a virtual hospital space. Hospital? Yeah, and then afterwards I went to a, a I went to his place there on the Centura, yep. the new place. There's us, new place. So you you come out of Hamilton House with those people and you went to stay in the hospital. Yeah. And then you went to stay in St Kilda. And yeah. did you see anyone from Hamilton House at St Kilda? No, no. I, no, I only seen a couple of people from Hamilton House in the same in the same building and the same place where I was before in the, in, in St Kilda before. She yeah. wanted you to go back there, but you didn't go back. No, no. I wouldn't go back there because I said, yeah. no. Now that's what he did to me. He take my body dolls away. I would get my ghost person. I would get mine. I don't like so. that. No. Don't like put in don't like they take my dolls away from me. But they are the only ones I've got. That's so your I don't want to take any dolls away from me again. So if, if there was one thing that you could say to the judges about what it was like living in Hamilton House, what would you want them to know? I, I'm going to tell when it, uh, if, if, if nearly got to find me out, I wouldn't. Why were they going to throw you out? Because of, I, because of someone was following me up there. Someone was following you? Yeah, a man. Yeah. And he was... Where did you know that man from? He came from Hamilton House too, we say. And he was following you outside Hamilton House? Yeah, he was following me all up there. And what did and you... He was asking her. <laughs> <laughs> all the time, are you a young person? What the heck? And what do you... I guess I was a bad tongue of to catch me. But it's not before him. And so what did you do? Did you tell someone? Yeah, I told her people. Well, in a place where I was, I told him. And that place, that's your friendship group that you yeah, go. Yeah, he was, uh, he was bringing up his f***ing, <laughs> he was cooking it. Well, we were not. All the other things go down in the hand in the house that you didn't recognise, but I do. Do you want to tell us some of those? What else happened that we, that we didn't, wouldn't recognise? Oh, God. Yeah, yeah, also. Also, place I had a way to realise. Oh, that's real nasty. Nasty people. And some of these people who throw things at you. People yeah, who live the there, there. would throw things at you. There yeah, was a man there and he threw stuff at me. And he, uh, he said, Hey, what do you think you're doing? I said, I don't like it. I said, Well, you don't have to throw things at me. That's because you don't like me, do you, eh? Like? He sat up in the book <laughs> and he said, you know, I know I don't. I don't talk to many people, even in, even in our place now, I don't talk to many people because they don't like me. Some I don't like me, others don't. But you're happy now where you yeah, are. I'm happy That's... now, yeah, I'm happy now. But we've been so well, me and all. So I'm happy. That's very lovely. Well, thank you so much for coming to see us today and for sharing your story, firstly with me, but also on this recording for the judges. So I, I'm really thankful. It's it's very important people tell their stories. Yeah. Is there anything you'd like to say in signing off? Anything else you'd like to share? Yeah. No. 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 No, I saw. <clears throat> yes, Ms. Dawson. Thank you, Chair. The next witness witnesses will be the panel from Winteringham. So I would like to invite Brian Lipman and Kate Rice to come and take a seat. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Thank <clears throat> you.
<clears throat> Please do sit down. <clears throat> Yes, um, <clears throat> Ms. Rice, Mr. Lipman, thank you for coming to the Royal Commission. Thank you too for uh, <clears throat> the detailed statement uh, that you've provided, which uh, we have uh, read. Uh, I'll explain where everybody is, not that there are that so many people, but uh, Commissioner Galbally, whom you can see on screen, is participating in the hearing from Melbourne. Commissioner Ryan is on my left. I'm the chair of the Royal Commission. I understand that <coughs> each of you uh, wishes to take an affirmation. I would therefore ask you to follow the instructions of my associate who is located to my right, and uh, he will administer the affirmation to you. I will read you both the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll now ask Ms. Dowsett to ask you some questions. Thank you, Chair. Ms. Rice, you prepared together with Jane Barnes a witness statement for the purpose of this Royal Commission. That witness statement is dated the 15th of August 2022. And for the Commissioner's information, it's in bundle B1 behind tab 16. Ms. Rice, have you had an opportunity to review that statement in preparation for giving evidence today? I have. Are there any corrections that you wish to make? No. Are the contents of the statement true and correct? They are. Thank you. And Mr. Lippman, I understand you've had an opportunity to review that statement in preparation for joining Ms. Rice on the panel. I did. Okay. And in her opening, uh, Ms. Bennett indicated that Mr. Lippmann, you are the CEO of Winteringham. How long have you been in that role? Uh, I started the company in 1989 and I've been there ever since. And Ms. Rice, I understand you've recently had a promotion. What's your current role? I'm currently General Manager of Home Supports at Winteringham. And can you briefly explain to the Royal Commission what you do in that role? So the role involves um, the overall management of all Winteringham's in-home supports. So that at the moment that includes um, oversight of 850 federally funded aged care packages. And prior to taking up that role, you had a role in relation to the provision of care at the SRS level. That's right. So prior to the current role, I was... Um, approach to be a project manager in Winteringham's quality team and that involved now to date three SRS projects so I oversaw the provision of care and supports to the three SRSs that were facing closure. Okay. So we you have the on the ground information about SRSs yes. if I can put it that way and Mr Lippman you're you're the the head of the organisation you have that oversight. I'd like to begin by asking some questions about the, the care and support needs of the cohort of people who are resident in SRSs. So if we could begin first with Angus Martin House, that's Winteringham's pension level SRS. You've addressed this in um, beginning at paragraph 27 of your statement, but if I could ask you, perhaps Ms Rice, if you could to outline briefly um, or Mr. Lippman, if it's a better question better addressed to you, but what is Angus Martin House and who do you provide care and support to? Um, I wonder if I can take it a step back um, and talk about, uh, I know you want to talk later on about the viability of SOSs. Should I think it might be better if we just address the question. I'm, <coughs> I'm sure Ms. Dowsett will okay, come in due right. course to the topic you're anxious to address. Let, let's concentrate on the question and then we'll take the others as they come. Fine. Um, question again then? Uh, the, the resident profile of the people who live beginning at Angus Martin House. So what are their care and support needs? You can... mm -hmm. So... It, the Angus Martin House is located in a very disadvantaged area of Melbourne called Frankston with a high degree of homelessness and, and a place we didn't have a lot of presence in before. 
So the, the demographic of the clients that are being referred are generally local people there. Um, we have a focus um, and a clientele of 50, age 50 and above. So they're ageing people with disabilities that move into Angus Martin. Um, there's more men than women at the, at the SRS, but predominantly um, it's psychosocial disability, but really dual disabilities. So we see physical people with physical disabilities. Um, a lot of people, a lot of the residents have diagnoses of schizophrenia, bipolar, that's very common, but also with that comes intellectual disability. So it's an interesting profile that often people are not presenting necessarily with one predominant disability. And because of our specialty working with people with alcohol dependency and drug dependency um, and people of age, we get a lot of people who've got diagnosed alcohol related brain injuries um, and brain injury coming, coming to live there. How do residents make their way to Angus Martin House? What's the referral process? So interestingly, um, as was referenced before, there was a lot of SRSs in that particular area, which is down the peninsula, and quite a few of those have closed. So Wintringham, we received quite a lot of referrals and have been, as other pension level SRSs have closed, people will reach out to us to take their residence on. Um, certainly the large public hospital down there re refers people mental health, so area mental health services, um, NDIS providers. Um, so it could be a range of homelessness agencies and services that, that know about Angus Martin House. But because we do older people, um, it tends to be a place of choice that people reach out to us. And, and as Brian was just saying, um, Corrections Victoria. So people, older people exiting prisons with disabilities is a place that they can refer older people. And you've set out in paragraph 34 of your statement, the staffing profile at Angus Martin House. So the, this is the Wintringham staff. And I think it would be fair to say in summary that that is in excess of the regulatory minimum. Would you agree with that proposition? Yes. Can you explain to the Royal Commission why Wintringham has taken the decision to staff the way it has at Angus Martin? So from, from, from my opinion, um, this, when I've just described the type of residents that live there and there's some ageing related needs in addition to the disabilities that present, in Winteringham's opinion, the minimum staffing levels that were referenced before of one is to 30, we would not be able to ethically or professionally run an SRS and, and not be able to and not provide the staffing that th that group of people provide. We're used to running aged care facilities, so we know the level of care and support that people require. So although it's not nowhere near the level of support an aged care facility can offer, we, we make sure as an organisation that we have professionally trained nurses, we have recreation, we have um, a social worker who provides case management. We, we do over and above the minimum requirements, but it's very difficult to fund that. Yeah, I could only just add to that is that some of those people aren't necessarily based entirely at the Angus Martin, but they come from within the company. So, uh, for example, a, a range of clinical care nurses, for example, are not based at Angus Martin, but they go right through the company. So therefore, as a product of the size of our organisation, we can draw on resources that um, mm. would not be possible if it was a standalone SRS for profit or, or not for profit. And Angus Martin, sorry, Winteringham is a not-for-profit organisation. Correct. And uh, this is the, the point I think you wanted to get to before. What can you tell us about the financial viability of the model that you're using firstly at Angus Martin? Is it financially viable? Uh, no, it's not financially viable and, and there is no way that I can understand how it ever could be. Uh, I, I think the, the issue really is that um, uh, for-profit SRSs have to pay um, a mortgage or a rental on their property. They need to pay uh, tax and they presumably need to make a profit. Otherwise, why would they do the service? 
a not-for-profit organisation that can be granted a building such as we were uh, is excluded from all of those three things. So it is possible, therefore, to think that it may be possible to be viable. Um, in spite of all of the cross subsidization do we do within the company, and in spite of a very generous uh, grant from a philanthropic organization for an outreach worker, uh, we're still not viable. And uh, it's just, it's a, we just see it as a service that Winteringham should do. Our board has accepted that, but it is not viable. And I don't th believe um, it is possible to be viable and, and provide any, any form of quality services. I notice in paragraph 31 of the uh, statement that uh, you provide certain demographic information. Of the 41 residents, how many are participants in the NDIS? How many? So yeah. we've got out of the current load, we have 16 people who are NDIS recipients. There are, I think, two at the moment who are not on either an aged care package or an NDIS, and the remainder are actually recipients of Commonwealth-funded aged care packages. Aged care packages. Yeah, as well. That's right. And that's very unusual that we have so many people because we've, ha we've assisted them access Commonwealth aged care packages because you can live at an SRS until you know, well, forever, essentially. So there's not an, a maximum age cut off. So we have people obviously over 50. So if you're then over 65, so we have residents over the age of 65. So we would um, support them to go through my aged care to access an aged care package because you're ineligible for an NDIS package or to apply for one once you turn 65. <clears throat> Paragraph 31 indicates that 18 are on an aged care pension, 23 are on the disability support pension. Yep. If someone is on the disability support pension, having a look at uh, paragraph 32, residents are charged a basic daily fee for the day-to-day -day services they receive. That's 85% of a resident's base pension, plus 100% of the rental assistance. In a typical case, what does that leave the resident who is on a disability support pension? At the moment, it's just under $200 a fortnight. Over and above the amounts that uh, are referred yeah, to in paragraph our, 32. Yeah, and our pricing is similar to what we would charge in our residential aged care facilities. I but see. they don't, obviously, in a residential aged care facility, you don't get rent assistance. Right. So it's not, it's about a hundred dollars a week. People end up with some. And as far as those who are on the uh, are participants in the NDIS, you've said 16 of them, 16 of the residents are in that category. What is the uh, revenue that comes into your organization through those participants? So they're supported by a range of providers, but the rent the rent that's charged to an NDIS participant yes. or a, an aged care participant package, the rent's the same. So we have a consistent um, rental. Yeah, sorry, I, oh. I, I should have asked the question in a different way. Oh, okay. Do, do uh, any of the 16 NDIS uh, participants, do their packages come to you in any way for the services you yes. provide? Yes, so we provide support coordination to people that live at Angus Martin if they've chosen to use Winteringham. So if they choose um, your organisation as the support coordinator, yes. you act in that capacity? Yes. Are all six, do all 16 choose you? No. So there are different support There's Lots of different support coordinators, yep. So people can pick whoever they choose and they can also choose their core providers. Right. Yep. Uh, do you provide any other services that might be paid for out of the NDIS package for the 16? Yep. So if you if you had a so say for example if we have a client at Angus Martin and they choose to have Winteringham services, um, they can choose to have core supports, but usually it's around the category called community access. So the staff don't work at the site. Um, they work at different Winteringham offices. So a recreation service, for example, can be delivered into the person living at Angus Martin to help them access the local community. Right, thank you. 
Uh, Mr. Lippmann, I think you said that there's cross subsidization involved for this particular facility. What form does that cross subsidization take? Oh, as I mentioned before, it's it's a uh, um, it's using services that exist within the company to um, uh, assist Angus Martin. That can be anywhere from finance, it can be from recreation, it can be from clinical care team, it can be from senior managers to come and give support. Uh, it can come from a range of services which a standalone SOS wouldn't have. That's what I meant by that statement. So you're referring to cross subsidisation in the sense that there are people within your organisation uh, who uh, wouldn't necessarily be allocated to this facility, but uh, they do perform some services at this facility. Correct. It's not a financial cross subsidy. Uh, not not in a direct financial sense. Um, well, I suppose the closest one would be food. Yeah. We would charge for food, but um, um, it's it's uh, it's probably sounding a little bit wobbly. But what is what we're trying to do is is keep the building operating. Yeah. And any, any way we can, and if we've got the resources within the company, we will do so. Is there a document that sets out uh, the standalone financial position of Angus Martin? Um, or is it absorbed within the general? Yes, there is. We can easily provide mm. that. All right. We might uh, mm, we'll sure. get that in due course. If that's all right. mm. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Please do continue. Mr. Lippmann, you mentioned that you um, might charge for food as one of the, the cross subsidisation um, elements. Does that mean that Winteringham buys in the food and on sells it into Angus Martin? Is that what you meant by that? Um, yes, I suppose that's that we, 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 we make the food, deliver the food and, um, and provide it. Yeah. And, and within in their rent. Yeah. And yeah, included in their rent. Within the um, funding arrangements for Angus Martin House, is there a budget allocation for food per resident per day? So out of their rent, how much of that is allocated towards food? Um, well, we would, we would spend um, about $24 a day on um, each person. Each person. I might just say, as a, um, Kate informs me that the SRS that we took over was running at $2 a day. The food? Yeah. yeah. Per person? Yep. Yeah. That's what the, the, the three places that we took over were running, from what we can gather, around about $2 a day. We, we spent $24 a day. Because they used a lot of donations. And, and, from and can I say that that is just an indication um, throughout all the services that we're providing. They're way in excess of what would normally exist and that's why it's unviable but yet we think that it's uh, it's at a minimum we think we should be actually doing even more just out of interest the um council assisting mentioned at some stage rather that there was funding from the victorian government yeah. to assist in viability i think it's called savvy funding. savvy funding yeah do you receive that um yes but it's 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 not much it's 100 grand isn't it? 100 grand yeah. 100 thousand dollars for 40 people was it yeah, it's 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 a uh, um, um, yeah. I must Do you know, know how that's al how is that allocated? Because apparently the whole program's worth thirteen and a half million. Yeah, it's not easy to get. Um, uh, is it allocated on a per capita basis? In a, look, I, th I think you no. I think it's a flat fee. But I think um, you will have department people tomorrow. They'll be able to explain okay. that. I think it. I think it is a flat fee. And and I can. I mean, I can just briefly answer your question in terms of the the contact I had with the savvy funding and the PL. I think it's called P, yeah, PLP funding at the two SRSs that we'll get to. But what happened is what happens is that the department allocates funding under those two um, areas to a local provider. So this is different to Angus Martin. So they might find a community health centre and the funding goes to them. Oh. And then they work with the proprietor on what would you like to spend that money on? So it could be fruit each week or new beds or so they work individually with that particular proprietor about how the money's spent. Oh, okay. So yeah. it's not given to you as a cash grant. No, but our I think our specific arrangement with Angus Martin is it comes to Winteringham. 
because we came into the field of late, well, late in the piece. Yeah, and I think that the other point, no doubt Council's going to mention this, but as far as we know, we're the only not-for-profit provider. So therefore there are some slightly different arrangements. We'll allow Council to uh, continue by asking some questions. Thank you, Chair. So you've mentioned a couple of times about the, the, the three SRSs. So I just want to take a little bit of time to talk about those. Uh, the first one was Hambleton House. And so this is or was an SRS in Melbourne that Winteringham was, came in to or was asked to come in to provide services to the former residents, but you never Winteringham didn't provide any services in the Hamilton House building, is that correct? If I can refer to the person in the video that we just watched, um, she actually was a very recent recipient of a Winteringham aged care package, actually. So just before the COVID outbreak happened, that particular lady had actually come on to an aged care package, which was terrific. I think her support people had tried for a long time. So she was a Winteringham client. So we had just started providing care and support services as best as we could into Hambleton House to support her. It's just generally the support was provided in the front yard and not into the building because it was difficult to get in. And are you able to say what that difficulty was? Yes. So the difficulty was often around um, proprietors or staff who were present at the time um, discouraging visits inside the house and into Denise's bedroom. So usually the suggestion was when our colleague, my colleagues went to actually visit Denise, it was suggested it would be better to meet with her in the garden. And that was a very common story that, that I heard directly from lots of providers, it's best to meet in the garden. And when our staff actually did provide, get in to provide services directly to that particular lady, it appeared often that there was um, a very quick tidy up that happened, that doors and windows were open when the staff came to visit so that the smell would obviously not be so pungent. Um, but it's exactly, our staff have described exactly as the lady has described the state of the room. It was like, it was a room under a, under a staircase, almost the size, a bit bigger than a cupboard area. So the, the stories definitely match her experience. But for the broader Hambleton House population more generally, it was after the closure that um, Winteringham was engaged to provide services at a, at a facility, at another location that was sourced by the department. You came in and provided SRS style services at that location? Yes, correct. And in the course of doing, providing that service, you were given some photographs by the department from Hambleton House? That's correct. And can you just tell the Royal Commissioners what the purpose, as you understood it, of those photographs being provided to you was? So all the residents came to us at the backpackers in St Kilda without any possession. So the department approached me directly and said, I've got a series of photographs. Could you go and show, we don't know whose room is who, could you go and show the photographs to your residents so that they can select what items they would like brought to them at the backpackers, including what items would you like laundered? Can I just briefly interrupt? When we say backpackers, it was actually empty. It was a backpackers. It became empty because of COVID. Mm. And so the department secured the building. So it's not as though we were in there with backpackers. <laughs> no. Sorry, I just want to make sure that's yeah, clear. It sounds a bit strange, yeah. but yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lippman. Um, if I could just ask the operator to bring up the, the photograph um, ending uh, 0101. So, Commissioners, these photographs that I'm about to show are a, a selection from behind tab 20. Um, given that the time constraints of this morning, I'm not going to show all of them. But if we could have this up. So, um, Ms. Rice, this is a photograph from inside Hambleton House, as you understand it. That's correct. And it shows what appears to be a shared bedroom 
two beds. Yes. And you were given this and all of the photographs we're going to look at for the purposes of a resident identifying their property, anything that they'd like to have brought yes. to them. If we could turn, uh, turn please, the photograph ending in 104, it's this. So this is a photograph of a mattress. And I think you were telling me that the, the resident whose mattress this was wanted it. Yeah, because he'd paid $4,000 for it. It was a Bambillo brand mattress. So I had to have this very um, <laughs> challenging discussion that it wasn't, that we weren't able to have it cleaned and then properly returned to him. So he was quite distressed because he told me that it was, that it was blood stained and it was actually full of bed bugs. Mm. Uh, if we could turn to the photograph ending 106. So this is another shared bedroom of a resident? That's correct. And uh, we see in this photograph and in the earlier shared one, no apparent provision for privacy in this room? No. Uh, turning then to the photograph ending 107. This is a, a resident's room and it appears to show in the bottom right hand corner a mattress on the floor, is that? That's correct. And then if we could have next the photos ending 108 and 109. Now I've asked for these to be displayed side by side, but they're unfortunately around the wrong way. So in the, the image on the left of the screen, oh, wow got skills now, <laughs> flipped it over, thank you. So what we can see now is that the room is the length of the single bed, is that correct? Correct. And this is a, a residence room. There's no other mattress in this room though. This is the whole of the room we can see here. That's correct. I'll just add, Council, that in spite of all the advances in technology, photographs don't smell. No. You have no idea what these places smell like. Mm. Mm. Okay. And uh, we can take those images down now. Thank you, operator. So you've set out in detail in your statement the services that were provided to the former residents of Hambleton House. And one of the things that you did was to find secure accommodation for all of those former residents. And you, you've outlined where where you were able to find accommodation for them. But can you talk about the, the challenge of finding somewhere for these people to go? Who, how did you find some accommodation? It was extremely difficult for our team because we had a 12 week time frame. Um, so you can imagine in 12 weeks, it took several weeks to even get to know people and know what their support needs were. And then it was several weeks before the residents were even told that Hambleton was actually going to be closed. So initially the group of residents we had about, apart from two people, so we had 20 people saying, I actually want to go back. We've seen what it was like. I want to go back. That's home. I want to go back. So working with a group who were very institutionalised to say, actually, you can't go back. So we need to find somewhere else. People didn't even want to engage in discussions with us about where to. So it began a very difficult process to locate suitable accommodation long-term for people who mostly lacked capacity and were most and generally were actually still subject to an ongoing relationship with the proprietors. So in the end, we worked with the Office of the Public Advocate and the Mental Health Service predominantly to actually assess what sort of accommodation people needed. And a significant number, and they all had disabilities, were actually eligible and appropriate for residential aged care. And I think that was probably one of the disturbing things. I mean, that wasn't then hard to find appropriate vacancies into specialist homeless aged care providers. But to get people through the assessments of my age care, mm -hmm. and particularly for those people who are under 65, is really very, very difficult. So the people that lived in these rooms couldn't live independently in our assessment. They couldn't go into social housing properties on their own with some support. 
And certainly when we reached out to the NDIS, in 12 weeks, it was not possible for the NDIS, really to be fair, to come to us to say, oh, we'll, we'll help and we'll find some accommodation. And they didn't have money in their packages to even pay for things like NDIS funded respite. So we worked really hard to get people assessed for aged care placements, which, which includes Denise, so really successful. Um, and then we looked to a very, very limited um, arrangement in Melbourne of some places that are more congregate living style that provide 24 hour support, support, which there's almost, there's nothing much available. Um, and then a couple of people were convinced, I would have to say, to move to other SRSs that were connected to the previous proprietors. Um, and try as we might to convince them otherwise, um, they moved across to other SRSs and then onto another pathway. But um, so we, yeah, we, we essentially were able to find accommodation for everybody. Those we struggled with. So for example, if a couple of people might've had really serious disabilities like schizophrenia, um, current psychosis, and really there was not somewhere that could take them because they were actively drug using. I looked myself to the homeless service system to say, can you, can you help us out? Do you have any options, even a short-term option? And the homeless service system really that, that exists in Melbourne were not really equipped to deal with people who have high support needs. Um, so I had to approach crisis accommodation services and th who are not used to dealing with anyone on NDIS. Um, and so the pushback I got was, well, they're on NDIS, so therefore they're not really a high priority. You need to go back to the NDIS and try and get the NDIS to help. So we went sort of round and round. And in 12 weeks, it was, it was very challenging. I mean, we got there in the end, um, but we got several people guardianships through VCAT, which is unfortunate we had to get to that, but I really had to have the support of Office of Public Advocate to really help me to push through some of these barriers to getting accommodation for people. But I couldn't get, it. so no, but actually one lady, so all that, none, none of the other NDIS recipients went into NDIS funded accommodation. Thank you. Wasn't there. Thank you, Ms. Rice. So that's the, the Hambleton House scenario. And there were two other, two other SRSs that are related to one another. And I'll ask you not to say the names of the other SRSs. But this was the second project or the second, second and third project where Winteringham actually went into those SRSs and provided supports and services to their residents. That's correct? That's correct. And you say in your statement, you talk about um, the initial difficulty that you faced was identifying who were the residents of this SRS. There was a an inconsistency in the documentation between who was on the list and who was in the buildings, is that correct? That's correct. And so it took you some time to identify your residents? That's correct. And if I can, you implemented the, uh, uh, sorry, I'll begin again. The services that Winteringham provided in these SRSs, you modeled those off what you do at Angus Martin House. That's correct. And ultimately a decision was taken that the residents of those SRSs would be, the, the SRSs would be closed and those residents would move. But that wasn't our decision. That was, no, no, a decision was yeah, taken. Yeah. Yeah. And you then, um, without going again into the detail you've just provided for Hambleton House, you were able to work through that process and find secure accommodation for all of those residents. Yes. Our job was primarily to um, look after the service and the residents until uh, the, um, uh, the government, the, the assessors, decided what to, mm, to, yeah. uh, to do with the service. 
And while you were providing those services, uh, Ms. Rice, I understand you took some photos inside each of these SRSs. That's correct. And I'd like to bring some of those up now. If operator, if we could have the photo ending in 90095. So this is, we see a bed and a curtain. As I understand it, this is a shared room and so that the curtain is the privacy for this, the resident of this room. That's correct. At the time that Winteringham was providing services in this SRS, how many residents were in this room? Two. And operator, if we could now have the photograph that ends in 9-2. Ms Rice, can you explain to us what this is? So it's a... It, it's a padlock um, with a bike, well, it looks like a bike chain that I came across personally myself in the first week of providing support. So I was there late one night working and at about nine o'clock at night, a staff member in front of me chained the door. So I was inside the building. So I questioned what was happening. And the answer that I was given was that, um, this was this this was the arrangement that previous management had set up and this was the way it was always done can i just pause you there yep. so this is photograph is taken from inside the building the front door that's correct. these are the front doors there the, the chain and the padlock hold the doors shut from the inside yes and what did you do other than you took the photograph what steps did you take so I immediately contacted um, the, acting, the acting proprietor, who was Ernst & Young, um, who immediately contacted um, the head of human services regulator, called him directly, and the, it was removed immediately and put out of, I mean, no one was able to do it again. Interestingly, though, as this was carrying, there were residents around me when I was quite horrified about it. And I asked them, do you know how to get out? Mm. Um, and a couple of them said, oh, no, we've seen what the code is, so we could get out. And then other people said to me, oh, I would have no idea. Um, and they said, oh, well, we'd probably try and get out the back door because I immediately was worried about fire and, uh, of course, terrible, terrible um, but the, per, the staff member who actually was attaching the lock, he genuinely could not see that there was a concern. He'd been working there for a long time. He genuinely couldn't see there was a concern, but he said he was operating under management direction. What would have happened if there'd been a fire? I don't know. Mm. People couldn't have got out. Uh, thank you, operator. We can take that one down. So, so those two photographs are from one SRS. I want to now move to the second of the two SRSs. Operator, if you could put up the photograph ending in 0062. By the way, when you say Ernst and Young were the acting proprietor, I take it they were the administrator. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this is a photograph. It appears to be of a bathroom and the, I'm not sure if it's a PowerPoint or just a light switch is hanging off the wall. That's correct. Was this bathroom in use? Yes, it was. Operator, if we could turn to the next photograph, which is uh, ending in 6.3. Uh, now, Mr. Lipman, I understand that this photograph is taken from a video, is lifted from a video that you shot, is that correct? Um, yes, we were already in the building for about um, a week or 10 days and I visited and uh, the manager who reported to Kate was telling me what the, the buildings was like and I said, it's a pity I wasn't here when you first arrived. And she said, oh, we've got a room, we, we haven't opened it, I'll show you. And uh, and I took this video and you've obviously taken a clip out of it again. Uh, just have to remind you, as you have obviously were acknowledging to me before, um, the smell is, uh, is pretty powerful. So when the manager said that this room hadn't been opened, there was no resident living in here at the time? Not at the time. This is one of the strange things. Maybe Kate can mm. talk more of it, because uh, obviously Kate knows a lot more about this actual operation than I do. But um, 
the numbers of people that we expected to see at the site weren't there, which raises an, a, a whole range of issues which we're not competent to, to discuss, but where are they? Where were they? If we could turn please to the photograph ending in 0069. Ms. Rice, can you explain what this is a photograph of? So I took this photo and this is a very small sample um, of some of the mail that we gathered and found in the office of the SRS. So we had boxes of mail. And who is the mail addressed across. to? So the, the mail was lots of names of people I would have to assume were ex-residents. And there was also mail for current residents that was just sitting there. Some was opened and, and some were sealed. And some of these residents aren't, weren't there. Mm. Uh, just moving on quickly. So uh, if we could have a quick look at the photo ending in 7.3. Now this shows a bed and a mattress on the floor, but Ms. Rice, I understand this is a staff bedroom. This is the sleepover room, which was in a, um, sort of an adjacent sort of pop-up, um, demountable, yeah, and, and bedtime was, we were told, or I was told directly it was about 9 o'clock, so the person would go and hop, in, well, hop into bed, I assume, at 9 o'clock, um, but it was quite set. You had to go sort of down a hallway, a ramp, to actually get into, into the building. It was like a sleep out. Sleep out. Uh, the photograph ending in 7-9. Ms. Rice, can you tell us what this is? So this was a resident shower. Um, so there was a, a tap and another tap that was adjacent to the side to get some running water out of, but it struck me as really disturbing to see a whistle because I could have only assumed that was for someone to get help if they needed to reach out to a staff member. And the final photograph I'd like you to look at, please, is the one ending in 0085. And so this is a shared room and we see that there are some wardrobes in the middle. That's correct. And it's your understanding that that's to provide privacy for the residents who live in this room. That's correct. When you were providing services at this facility, were there residents living in this room? No, so like the other photo, this was a room that the door was locked, that we unlocked and I went in and it was almost like, where are the people? Because it was like someone should have been living in there. All their belongings were in there, everything. And it was just, it, it was like it had been abandoned. Um, where have they gone? Well, that's... That's the question. So we have suspicions where people went, um, but the lists, li lists as you referred to, didn't match when on the day we arrived of who we thought was living there, who the NDIS thought was living there and who actually was living there. And I think the other thing to say is that um, in at least one of the bedrooms, there was a, a frail elderly woman sharing a room with a 35 year old drug user. That was at, ha yeah, at Hambleton. House, okay. yeah but but still but yes it's it definitely sharing was sharing was really common because you got a rent discount the, did you say you you think the ndis would have believed someone was living in this room so when we tried to match all the records of who was actually a current resident and who was currently paying none of the lists initially matched up so, so is the suggestion the NDIS would have been paying for those people even though they were not? No, but present. their administrators might have been, financial administrators. Well, uh, yeah, but that... But they're through their plans, the that, address listed for some people um, would have still listed the SRS. But no, so no one told the NDIS, I assume, that people had moved. Were you able to ascertain in the case, for example, of that room where two people would have been in shared yep. accommodation, what they would have been paying to the provider before you came in? Or is there no way for you to know? 
Yeah, so interestingly, I got um, provided with information of the rents that the, the current group were charging and they were really variable for no reason. So some people were on what I would consider a lower rent of about 700, 750, 760 a fortnight and that would go up to well over 900 but there was no rhyme or reason that I could see of why people would charge different amounts when everyone's income was the same, essentially a disability support pension predominantly in this case, except that I came across, I suppose, evidence um, that some residents were written to saying your rent will go up by $20, $30 a fortnight because your care needs are increasing. Does that mean that if you take the lower of those amounts, I think you said 700... 760, 760 380 a week, that the two people sharing that room would be paying... Both that. Between them, $760. No, each of them. So that's the discount. That would be the cheaper discounted rate. So no, I'm sorry, I person... meant per week. So the, yeah. taking it per fortnight... Oh, yes, yes, $1, correct. $1,520 yes. a fortnight... Yes. For rental? Yes. For that accommodation? Yes. 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 Almost more than you've heard that bit. Now, the chair asked you a question about where the, where the missing residents might have gone to, and Ms Rice said you said you had some suspicions. One of the things you've referenced in your statement is the concept of share housing and we've also heard some evidence and we'll hear some evidence later in the hearing about this model called pop-up housing but you're, you're aware of some of the missing residents being located in this share housing that's correct and what how did you come to be aware of that so my first experience was at Hambleton house and I, I want to make it clear that the, usually the pop-up housing was was being operated by registered NDIS providers. So this is not an unregistered space that, that I personally had experience with. So for Hambleton House, I'd never heard of this concept before, except one of the residents... Um, that I've that I've talked about in in the submission, who has an intellectual disability and schizophrenia, was housed securely by us in a not for profit supported a com. And one morning I got a call saying, "Oh my goodness, Kate, help us! Um, this fellow had just disappeared in the night. He he was gone." And so then the story unraveled and due to COVID, they had signing in processes. So it was really good in that sense. So he'd been picked up um, by disability support workers in a vehicle outside the property um, who then drove him to a property in Melbourne's Outer West and basically just put him in a house. So his parents in regional Victoria were not contacted. The NDIS was not contacted state trustees who manage his funds weren't. So nobody knew where this poor fellow had gone to. He just disappeared. Um, and then information started coming through that I want a different support coordinator. I want to change all my NDIS arrangements. I want, you know, so the whole NDIS process started coming to life. But anyway, so... I initiated um, a report to the police through missing persons. And then I also did an urgent application to VCAT, which is a shame because the fellow probably didn't really need a guardian, but I, I was really stuck about how to get this fellow away because he then told the NDIS and told everyone, I'm, I'm fine at the new place. They're looking after me. You know, I don't want to go back to my older calm. I'm all right here. And then he was subsequently subsequently appointed a guardian but he was still moved a couple of other times to different properties like bungalow style accommodation run by a registered NDIS provider. Sorry can I just check do you mean SRS or NDIS? No an NDIS support provider whom he didn't know so they were sort of strangers to him that had turned up and essentially got him into the car and moved him. 
I'm a bit lost. What do you think happened? What I think happened is that there was a rely. I think there was a connection between probably the proprietors and this other, this NDIS ACOM. I mean, yeah, that was information we were provided with, that there was a relationship there because otherwise how would they know where to find him? And he told us oh, that he was getting lots of phone calls to his mobile phone saying, we want to move you, we want to move you. Um, but then within a couple of days of him moving, that's when, and, and the NDIS were able to tell me about this, that they'd received a phone call with the client saying, I don't want to be with my current NDIS provider. So all of that just happened really within a phone call. Um, and you can imagine his parents were incredibly distressed. So now he, he's got a guardian, but it's been a very long road um, to actually work with him around getting into really a reputable NDIS funded accommodation service. Do you happen to know the value of that person's NDIS plan? No. Now we are fast running out of time, but I, I do just want to ask you a couple of additional questions. SRSs have been described as accommodation of last resort. Would you accept that description? For whom? For the your question is providers of accommodation of last resort for whom? I think that's missing from the question. For people who need accommodation and can't find it elsewhere, it, it's it's the last step before sleeping on the street. Look, the, uh, these are these are qu hard questions to answer. I think I I would characterise SRSs as, as a market response to a failure in service. Um, if a government uh, doesn't provide a service and there is a demand for it, private enterprise will step in. It's only perfectly natural. Um, and, um, uh, and this is what's happened. I don't have a problem necessarily with uh, a range of accommodation. Melbourne is a town that's big enough to have a whole range of different types of services. But um, what, what amazes Kate and myself and our colleagues back at work is the, um, is the rigorous accreditation and auditing that we go through in aged care and NDIS. Uh, I have a whole fleet of um, assessors and people preparing ourselves for accreditation. I just don't understand how these- You mean for aged care? Well, also for NDIS, and because we're an NDIS providers too, you know, reg registration. I just don't understand how these services um, uh, happen. I, I, I am, I am, I don't necessarily want to know how how they manage to milk the system, but it's clearly it is it is happening. They're supposed to be regulated, yeah, aren't they, under state law? I know. I, I, um, I, I don't know. <coughs> I, I can only say. Um, yeah, I understand you're going to be speaking to Dr. Pierce later on. Um, when Hamilton House was, uh, because of COVID, that was the reason why we were called in. Um, as, I, as I parked the car and walked towards the new base centre, she rang me to say, I'm so pleased that finally someone like you can get in to this building. So she had been raising questions, probably need to talk to her about it, but these are, uh, these are continual problems. I, I, um, I know we're running out of time, but can I, can I, I I'm aware that this, your focus is on homelessness yeah. in India. And, okay. What's your focus about to be? Homelessness. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, um, I was at a meeting recently, not recently, quite a while ago, where the, the Prime Minister was at it and someone asked him um, about homelessness, what are you going to do about it? And he responded that homelessness is always a problem in society and there's very little you can do. And I've got to say that that's a common comment I hear from both sides of the house and from a range of people. And it's totally wrong. I, 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 I don't know how to solve some social problems. I don't know how to solve domestic violence, drug abuse, but I can solve homelessness. Homelessness is not hard to solve. You need appropriate housing and you need appropriate levels of support in the right places. And in the absence of those things, 
you end up having the abuses that Kate and self and our teams have had to go into. Yes. All right. Well, we won't necessarily take that as evidence of what the Prime Minister said, but of what you think he said. <laughs> well, didn't say we to, avoid, to avoid a possible problem. One, yeah. one yeah. final question from me. In paragraph 82, you refer to uh, the, the housing for the idea of housing first. Can you please explain to the Royal Commission what housing first means to Winteringham? You know, housing first is a is a overseas concept um, which we uh, have been uh, it's accepted that we do it too although we did it on our own terms unlike um, I had no idea of the term when we started using it it's essentially providing um, appropriate housing before you can provide any forms of support but it has to be um, uh, appropriate housing in the right in the right places and the right and affordability. Thank you, Chair. Those are my questions for these witnesses. I, I hand them to you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, if you don't mind, I'll just ask my colleagues if they have any questions to put to you. I'll start with Commissioner Ryan. I've asked my questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Galbally, do you have any questions? Um, just a couple of questions. Thank you very much. Um, very informative. Um, so with your own SRSs and the accreditation process as thin as it is, can you describe the accreditation process you have to go through for SRSs just briefly? Uh, so at the moment, obviously, we, as an SRS provider, we work under the SRS Act and regulations. So we have to have a series of policies and procedures that meet those requirements. So all of that is evidence and documented. And then we're subject, like we were with the other SRSs, to, um, to working with the human services regulator who can obviously do, they can do unannounced visits and booked in visits to actually come onto the premises and actually see that we're meeting, meeting the regulations, I suppose. Um, but, you, but you think that's pretty thin compared with the NDIS accreditation and aged care oh, accreditation? Compared to aged care, I mean, I've come from, um, I mean, Brian oversees multiple residential aged care facilities in his role as CEO, but I've come from managing an aged care facility. I did that for seven years at Winteringham. Um, and the, the system that was in, that's in place with management of complaints, um, uh, breaches or any reports that go to the aged care commission, um, the scrutiny that Winteringham or as a manager that I was under and what I had to res respond to and the quality, the face-to-face -face quality visits, you, you really couldn't compare. So um, very and, different. And is the SRS model audited? Are you audited regularly? about standards and quality. Yeah. Right. Mm. And Mr. Yeah, Mr. Lippman, what should the government provide in, in this space instead of SRSs, if I could ask you? Uh, well, Commissioner I Galbally, do you mean the state government or the Commonwealth government or both? Um, let's start with state, yeah. Well, I think that there, is, there are possibilities of having um, uh, some interim, period, interim service from independent housing to, um, uh, in our case, aged care facilities. And they could be an SRS model, but it has to be run in a different way than it is now, and it has to be properly audited. Uh, I think if once government funds start to go in and flow into a service, there has to be some level of accountability on how those funds are used. and. Um, and we would we would welcome that, but we've pre presented some some th preliminary um, thoughts to government about how a service uh, like this could survive. They clearly, if they if you want to have the uh, not for profit involved in it, involvement in it, it needs to be um, uh, viable, and um, uh, I, and I think it, it it can be, but it can't be in the, in the way it currently is. And it also needs to be livable. I, I, livable and also, yes, and I mean, they're outrageous, these photos that you saw. I mean, they, they, 
they're, they're nothing like what we provide, nothing like what, and yet there's so many of those clients uh, who are on the verge of being eligible for our, our mainstream services. These are people that are lost to the system. Would you mind sending in your preliminary thoughts that you've written down about? Um, yeah, sure. Thanks. Well, I think we um, might. We, I think we might organise that, please, through council to mm. determine whether and how that might be done in an and, appropriate fashion. And, and I think just as a, a final comment is in terms of the different types of accommodation, what we would have really liked access to. There was a group of people in the pension level SRSs who don't want to live by themselves. So they are looking for a community of people around them. So that, that small shared accommodation style, that congregate living, there's, there's space for that to be done really well. And the NDIS could assist with that. Our problem was it was very difficult to access. You couldn't access it quickly. And most people didn't have the funds in their plan. Mm -hmm. You know, it's big dollars. If respite, for example, for someone costs $14,000, that's what it costs. None of our um, men and women in, our, in these SRSs, they didn't have, you know, often that money in their plan to even pay for that. So finding a solution to homelessness through the NDIS was really, really difficult. And I don't really think at the moment there's a good response to people who are homeless. The plant planners who assign the funds and work with us really struggle to know sometimes what even an SRS is. They think it's an aged care facility. You say the person's homeless. Could you have funds for someone to work on that? There's not a response from an, from NDIS or within a plan that can provide appropriate supports to even help someone find housing. Mm. It's it's just not it's not a category. You know, it's it wasn't really there. So we had to actually then do that work, unfunded NDIS work. Mm. There there is a, a very quickly a a further point that Kate alluded to, but um, probably needs the commission needs to be aware of it. When, um, when Wintrigam started, I was able to successfully negotiate with government that uh, homeless people who had prematurely aged could enter aged care at 50 and above. Mm. And that was pretty well our model of care. So these were, these were prematurely aged homeless people. Um, now, for all the, the wonderful um, benefits of NDIS, it has created, and the Royal Commission, which we spoke to at the, in the Aged Care Royal Commission, they have decided that uh, people under 65 shouldn't be in aged mm. care, but for some people, uh, they should. And it's really, uh, it has made it very much more difficult for us and for Kate, for example, to have clients who are, um, are needing aged care, but, but um, uh, they, can't uh, they can't get in. So I think that, that, that we're working with the Commonwealth on trying to resolve that. And um, there's goodwill on both sides to get it resolved. But at this stage, it certainly is, a, is an impediment to people who are um, prematurely aged to get into aged care. With it, high clinical issues. With high clinical issues, yeah. And, and I think the other issues too is that um, while many of our clients like to live independently and most of our clients do live independently with appropriate supports, there are some people who do like congregate living. And we have a number of people who have come from SRSs who were um, in some cases fly blown. They were, and they were on death's door. And they've been, uh, one guy I was with, last night i mean he's been with us 17 years yeah. he's survived and prospered uh, 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 and and he loves the congregate living he's got friends there he's got support now it, it's not not that congregate living or community is what we would call it yeah. is right for everyone but it is right for some all right thank you um just by way of comment your, your observation about the scrutiny of aged care of course we've just had an aged care royal commission yeah. It doesn't always work, does it? Mm, mm. <laughs> so, no, that's right. But, uh, even the yep. even the system that appears that's, to be yes. very effective may, in fact, turn out to be at least uh, for mm. certain purposes not mm. to be terribly effective at all. Um, I want to ask you a question, and this is not intended to cast any doubt on the quality of the services you provide, but it's something that has arisen in a number of previous hearings. I noticed that as far as I can tell, the directors of Winteringham, none of them are people with disability, lived experience with disability. Is that right? Um, I, think, I think that's right, yes. Do you think there might be virtue? 
in uh, having on the board of directors someone with lived experience of disability? Uh, absolutely, I'll pass mm -hmm. that on to the mm -hmm. president. We, um, uh, <clears throat> um, absolutely, and it's always open for um, boards to work on I that. I raise the issue because it's been raised in a number of other hearings uh, with service uh, providers. I stress I'm not to raising it for the purpose of querying mm. the work that you do, mm. but it's a general issue that has arisen and it's one for the Commission yep. to uh, consider. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, I'm assuming there's uh, no one who wishes uh, to uh, ask any questions. All right, thank you. In that case, thank you very much for uh, giving evidence and for the uh, written material that uh, you have provided. Uh, as uh, sure. Commissioner Galvalli indicated, uh, your evidence has been uh, extremely informative. Thank you. Thank you. Do we take a, an adjournment now? Yes, please, Chair. Until when? Uh, if we could take 15 minutes. So How long? 15 minutes. Well, it's now 11.35. Uh, let us make it uh, 11.55. We'll return. The Royal Commission is adjourned. Okay. Fine. The Royal Commission is resumed. Yes, Mr. Bassett. Thank you, Chair. Before I hand over to Mr. Fogarty and the next witness, I would like to address the issue of uh, tender of documents and <coughs> tender the pre-recorded interview of Denise that was played earlier today. I tender the video into evidence and ask that it be marked Exhibit 26 slash 07. And what's the reference for it, please? Is it, what's the, has it happened identification? <laughs> It doesn't have, oh, sorry, yes, IND.0181.000.0. That enables us to know what it is. Thank you, Chair. All right, yes. that can be admitted into evidence. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Mr. Fogel. Thank you, Chair. The next witness is uh, Jacob, uh, which isn't his real name, it's a pseudonym. And Jacob is a former resident of Grace Manor, also formerly known as Meadow Brook, situated in Melton South in the northwestern suburbs of Melbourne. While it won't be played today, Jacob participated in a pre recorded video with me in June. Uh, that can be found behind Hearing Bundle B1 Tab 1 and a transcript behind B1 Tab 2. There are also some documents associated with Jacob, four of those in hearing bundle B3 behind tabs one to four. Right. But you're not tendering those at the moment? No, I don't seek to. I understand Jake will take an affirmation, All Chair. Right. Jacob, thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission to give uh, evidence. Uh, and I know you've uh, had a uh, previous uh, interview which has been recorded and which will in due course form part of the evidence. So we appreciate your assistance to the Commission. If you would be good enough to follow the instructions of my associates, if it's over here, he will administer the affirmation. Thank you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Yep. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, Jacob. I'll now ask uh, Mr. Fogarty to ask you some questions. Thank you, Chair. And Jacob, before I ask you questions, I'd like to acknowledge that your experiences at Grace Manor uh, prior to January this year when Winteringham uh, took over administration and we heard some evidence and I think you sat in through that evidence today yeah. um, involved for you a lot of frustration in how it was run. Um, I'd like to thank you for coming today and I'd like to thank you for the pre-recording that you've done um, to assist the Royal Commission to understand your experience. If there's any moment in my questions that you feel you need a break please let me know. Yep. We can do that uh, and, um, and I'm still learning this but if we can go slow for the interpreters um, that would be much appreciated. Absolutely. Um, Jacob, you were born and raised in Sunbury, which is in north 
Western uh, Melbourne. Yes. And you're the youngest of four boys. Yes. Uh, and you're still quite close with, I'll call him number three. Yes. Uh, one of your brothers. <laughs> and he assists you with um, engaging the NDIS with your disability support pension administration and yes. forms. Very, and you have a very close re relationship with him still. Yes. Um, you went through school in the Sunbury area with, with your brothers. I did, yes. Um, and in after school, as I understand it, you worked with the Dunlop factory for a number of years. Not directly after school, but the main job, the last sort of job, yeah. Yeah, all right. And that was till, and I'll come to that, until 2016, I think you were there. Something like that, yeah. And was it 15 or 20 years you worked there? Uh, it was about 17 or 18 years, yes. And you started from a, a storeman and worked up to... Yeah, and it became clerk. dispatch clerk, yes. And you enjoyed working there? Oh, yeah, yeah. What did you enjoy? I mean, the, the storeman work was menial sort of stuff. But the, the clerk's job, I really loved that, yeah. And you liked the, the social side or the community side of, of, of a place to work as well? Oh, it was all right, you know, it's... Yeah, you know, they're workmates, not your friends necessarily, they're associates, you know, so, yeah, yeah, got on well with them, yeah. I see. Um, you, I think in 2018 or 2019, you um, became eligible for the disability support pension. Yes, yeah, something around there, yes. Yeah. All right, and um, depression is one of the, um, uh, is a diagnosis that, that, um, yes. that uh, made you eligible for the disability support pension. Mm -hmm. uh, and is, is, is that something, that psychosocial disability, as it's sometimes called, or a type of, is that something that has affected you in, uh, over your, the course of your life? It wasn't something I recognised in my early life, but as I got older and met other people with depression and that, I recognised things that I'd had all through my life that were there, yeah, like even in HSC at one stage. Which is one morning when mum woke me up, and said, nah, not going. And I stopped going for about a week and she got the prefect from the school to come and chat to me to get me to get back, go back to school, yeah. So as early as your teens, there was something Oh, there. certainly, yeah. All right. You, you also have a physical disability, ankylosing spondylitis? Yes. All right. Uh, and how does that affect you? Um, it's, uh, what it does is it causes inflammation on, of soft tissue, so you have tendon, ligament, and cartilage. Uh, so my back is frozen up. I can't bend my spine. Um, and on your chest where the ribs connect to the sternum is cartilage, and they're sort of frozen up, so it reduces the expansion of the chest. Yeah. Or in breathing and that, yeah. Um, I understand you, uh, in, late, in later life, and I think it was after you worked at Dunlop, you did a certificate in aged care and home and community care? One yes, point. certificate three, yes. All right. And and did you have a, a an idea that you might work in that? Um, that was a course that I got to go through, through Centrelink, through, you know, job training to try and help you get back to work type thing. But, you know, at that stage, I think basically through time already away from work and plus on top of that my age you know got sort of thrown on the employment scrap heap yeah so currently you're you're 60 yes and was this around so 2016 you, you finished at thereabouts with Dunlop no no it was actually earlier with Dunlop I think oh gee that would have been about 2007 actually all right um and were you on was living the Centrelink pension from yeah, um, not straight away, because at the time I had the payout from being retrenched. Um, and then mum passed away and got some money from that. And basically with the depression, it was a matter of getting around to things, not getting around to things and sort yeah. of things. So I never got around to joining up to Centrelink and that until I ran out of money. Right. Basically, and then I sort of like had no choice, better do something about it. Yeah. And did your brother assist you with that at the time? Um, it was later on when I was um, found, got told about the NDIS and advised to go in after that, that I got advised to get somebody to help with it. And so I signed him as power of attorney because he's really good with the dotting the I's and crossing the T's sort of stuff. Yeah. All right. 
In terms of where you've lived over time, you when you were at the Dunlop factory, you worked. You lived in a private rental in Coburg for some time. Is that yes. Right? And you, I think you paid the real estate. You engaged with the real estate direct yes. directly. Yeah. Um, and then you moved from that property to Oak Park, yes. another suburb in in Melbourne. Yeah. Um, and you stayed at Oak Park from 1995? Uh, to... September 95 until PSRS, so 20, until 2016. So 2016 is when so you... So 21 years, yeah. All right. Um, and you left there because the landlord's son was going to move in, is that right? Something? Uh, no, I was getting evicted and, you know, with things that were happening and that, I was getting behind on bills and rent and stuff too, yeah. All right. Have you... Lived in public or social housing in your life? Never before, no. Have you applied? Have you ever applied to? No. Be? You haven't. All right. Is there a reason for that? Uh, never had a need to before. What about before going into the to Grace Manor, the SRS or Meadowbrook, as you sometimes call it? Did you consider public housing then? Uh, no, never thought about it. No. All right. You're. I think you've just given some evidence that you're on the NDIS. Yes. Uh, and you think your brother assisted you to apply? Yeah, to navigate or, through that, yeah. Um, Organising appointments and paperwork and everything, yeah. Um, looking back, is it something you think you could have done on your own? The application side of things and the assessment? Uh, well, I've got a reasonably good head on my shoulder, so I could have probably done it in the long run, but... Like with that depression, that would have been a long, drawn-out process. It would have been slow getting to things and yeah. let, letting things go by. And so, with him, it was he was all over it, sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. You you have a support coordinator. Yes. Um, and you're you're, in my words, but tell me if I'm wrong. You're happy with how they support you and and assist you with the NDIS. My support coordinator is fantastic. My yep. support workers great. Yeah, I've got a good. Uh, I've worked. At, been lucky that I've got a good team, but I've seen some bad ones. Yeah. All right. Can I ask you to reflect back to 2016? You moved into Grace Manor. It's in Melton South, yes. correct? And that's not far from Sunbury, is that right? Not a long way, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and was it an area, Melton South, that you would have gone around as a young person or as a kid? Um, used to, like when I played squash and that, we went there to play against teams in squash and that. So it was occasionally I went to Melton, but not a lot, but I was familiar with it, yeah. When you moved into Grace Manor, do you recall how many other people were there roughly? Oh, uh, the whole time I was there, it was probably 25 to 30 people. You know, so yeah, around about that, yeah. Was that consistent that they'd always be there? Yes, pretty much, yeah. Um, and what about the division of male and female? Do you... Did that change? Uh, what was that? Probably about two to one, male to female. All right. Yeah. And again, is that consistent over the... You were there five yeah, and a half yeah, years? That was, yeah, that stayed pretty consistent, yeah. And what about age-wise? What was the... What, what were the... Oh, geez, we had people as young as 20, 21 and right up to people of uh, 60s and 70s even, yeah. All right. And did you have your own room? Yes. All right. And you saw earlier in the evidence from Winteringham some photos. Yes, I recognised some of those rooms, yeah. Some of those were from Grace Manor, were they? Yeah. All right. Uh, and um, you had your own room, but were there share rooms of the type you might have seen in those photos earlier? Yes, there was the one that had the share room where the people had gone missing. I was actually recognised the room and know the people that were in it, yeah. I see. Um, can I ask you this? When you moved into Grace Manor, did you have a, a personal support plan or a support plan? Uh, not that I'm aware. I think when I first got there, they sort of done the paperwork that they had to do, but nothing really happened and it was never updated or anything, yeah. All right. When you say paperwork, was that an agreement or a plan or do you, do you not remember? Oh, uh, it was like... The rental agreement type thing, and but there was all there was something I think with a personal plan or something that they basically wrote down from the disability things that I had there. They sort of worked it out from that, so it wasn't so much going with going through it with me, but yeah, no, that was just 
still want a bit of paperwork. Nothing ever happened with it. What about over time? You're there five and a half years. Did nah, never, you ever never sat done down it. and discussed around what supports you needed? Never, no. Nah. Um, when you moved in, just to be clear, you were on a Centrelink pension that was on the disability support. Yeah, pension. I was on New Start. You're on New Start. And then two, and two or so years in, it changed. I changed to the NDIS, yeah. To the disability support pension. Disability support pension, yeah, sorry. And probably at the same time, that brother was assisting yeah. you to yeah. apply for NDIS. Yeah. All right. How Wait. did you uh, get to that place in the beginning? Um, well, we were looking for accommodation that I could afford and everything and through Vinnie Care. And at the time, it was actually something new that they came across. I think it was, I actually think it was my brother that found out about it from somewhere and mentioned it to the guy and he was like, oh, wow, this place. Yeah, and yeah so it was something new for them too at the time. And so it was through them that we found it, yeah. Okay, thank you. When you moved into to Grace Manor in 2016, you were charged, a, am I right, $330 a week? Yes. All right. Did you say a week? A week, so, yeah. yeah. Um, and that didn't change until 2021, is that right? That's right, yeah. And it went up to 360 60 a week, yeah. A week. Um, thinking about both your new start, but then also your disability support pension, how much, when it was $330 per week, were you left? Well, when, we could when I first moved in there and was on New Start, it left me about $20 a fortnight. A fortnight? After the rent and that was taken out, yeah. All right. What did you get for the $330 per week? What was provided to uh, Room with the bed. They washed the bed sheets once a week, cleaned the room once a week, and meals, and obviously electricity and gas and like their yeah, bills. Um, how were the meals provided? Was there a communal dining room or what? It was actually a, formerly a private hospital, so it had a kitchen area and a dining area. And, yeah, you go up there at the, at a lot of times and get your meal and you could sit in a dining area, you could take it back to your room if you wanted to. Yeah. I see. Thank yeah. you. Uh, on meals, uh, how would you describe the, the food and meals when you first moved in there? When I first moved in, I'd probably describe them something like your shell servo restaurant. Right. Yeah, so that, that were all right, but not, you know, not like restaurant or something, yeah. What about nutrition-wise? Uh, when I first moved in, yeah. okay, yeah. All right. Yeah. Did you get fresh fruit, well, that sort of thing offered to you? Not a lot. We did see the fruit truck, uh, fruit van that had come in, I think, once a week sort of thing and delivered right. boxes of fruit. And I think a lot of it went home in their boot because it wasn't much of it that we saw. Yeah. And then when Winteringham took over, all of a sudden it was like lots of fruit and veggies on the table. Yeah. <laughs> all of a sudden it was there. So it was a stark contrast when they took oh, over. Oh, yeah. Much different. Um, and did the meals on the food change over time? When Winteringham came in, they did. <laughs> but before that, yeah, early, like I said early on, they were the shells there, though, but pretty quickly it deteriorated and... Yeah, they're horrible towards the end, yeah. All right. Yeah. I should. Were you able to come and go from yes. Grace Manor? All yes. right. And there are shops down the road, is that yes. right? Yes. Yeah. So could you go and, <laughs> with your 20 bucks a fortnight, <laughs> go and buy food down there? Right, yeah, to? couldn't afford much with your $20, yeah. Yeah. You just mentioned um, to the chair about um, a cleaner coming in once a week. Mm. You shared communal toilets and yes. uh, toilets and a and a showers or a bathroom is that right yes did anyone any other residents have ensuite bathroom some of the rooms had the well in a lot of cases it was like two rooms had an ensuite between them where they had their own ensuite yeah um one or two of them had an ensuite to themselves okay yeah. how many people would have had on no no how many people would have shared the oh the communal toilet the communal oh, toilet 20 25 some all right and uh what about the you say the cleaning cleaning cleaner came in but uh was that cleaning for the, for the bathroom or your uh, yeah well they they were there monday to friday so they sort of go through the baths bathrooms and toilets but they were still not not real clean not and 
like doors didn't lock on most of the toilets and you know, pretty run down and the maintenance was poor. Yeah. Um, but then they and then they didn't have cleaners on the weekend, but people still use toilets and showers on the weekends. Yeah. Of course. And you're talking about cleaning the communal part area. Yeah. Yeah. What about your room? Did someone come and clean your room? Once a week, yeah. All right. They'd, they'd sweep and give it a sweep and a mop sort of thing. Yeah. And would you, would you be there always or sometimes they'd come when you weren't there? Um, sometimes they'd come when I wasn't there, but yeah. you, you know, usually I'd sort of work with the cleaner, right? They'd, they'd you know, make sure they were able to get in if I wasn't there, yeah. All right. Um, do you think that was enough cleaning of your enough assistance for you with cleaning of your room per week or not? I think once a week with the cleaning of my room would, was good enough, yeah, for yeah. me, for the room, yeah. What about the bar, the communal areas and the bathrooms? No, I think that needed, well, that, that, the, the passages and that got swept and what, or whatever daily, but, and the toilets got, like I said, they were Monday to Friday on the weekend, they weren't there. And so someone made a mess on one of the toilets and that, the staff would leave it until the cleaner came in on Monday. Right. And they'd sort of close off that toilet. Okay. Yeah. And you'd have to make do with whatever. Yeah, use another toilet. Yeah. How many toilets were in the communal? Uh, well, there's probably about three of them around, three or four of them around the place, and they'd have a couple of toilets and a shower in cubicle in each of them, yeah. And you said, I think you just said that the toilet doors, the lock, they didn't lock. Oh, no. Nah. No, the, most most of them it didn't lock when when I came there. Some of them didn't have locks. Some of the locks didn't work, um, and that was like that until Winteringham came in and started doing some maintenance work. Like five five and a half years. Yeah. Was there a maintenance person that came along? Uh, there was people that were there as maintenance, but you know, come and go and keep sort of changing. But yeah, you tell them something was that and was wrong or something. I don't know if they even got told about it. You know, was there it just a got left like, aside? Sorry, Jacob. Yeah. Was there a feedback or complaint system or, or method you could do? Not, not really. I mean, that they, they they used to say, if you have a problem, let us know. But then times when I complained, they'd go to you know be talking to my brother about he's always complaining. <laughs> what are you supposed to do? <laughs> yeah. Um, what about heating you? of your rooms over winter for for example was there heating they had those old those old um bar heaters along on down the wall sort of thing um and to pump out the back so sort of the switch a uh, switch out there that put it on and quite often you'd have the heaters on during the day monday to friday when it was like office hours and people would be coming in from the outside and coming yeah. and going but then at night time when it was cold or whatever and on the weekends you'd be switching it off to save gas and that these are the ones in your room. Is yeah, it yeah, room? yeah. It was the one switch outside that ran the heaters for all the rooms. So could you yeah. control it? You had to go outside. Well, I, I knew where the switch was, so I used to go out and switch it on. But when they realised I'd switched it on, they'd go and switch it off. And at one stage, I even put a padlock on the cabinet to stop me getting in there switching it on. Right. Um, what about electricity to your room <coughs> and lighting and things? Yeah, we had electricity, but I had a situation there. Where at one stage, there was a. Uh, a fuse on the switchboard that kept flicking off that was supplying the power points to about seven rooms, including mine. Yeah. So w when it went, you had light, but no power, you know, no tally, no kettle, no nothing, you know, and for the seven rooms, and I was complaining to them about it for months and they wouldn't do anything. And I actually ended up going on a bit of a hunger strike because they wouldn't do it. And then eventually something else went wrong, and that's when they eventually got the electrician in and fixed it. <laughs> and you, how long did you go on your hunger strike for? Quite a uh, while. Well, that was from the start of August, early August to about fifth of August or something, until about the twenty eighth of December. You lost quite a lot of weight, didn't you? Uh, about thirteen kilograms. I think you just drank coffee, didn't you? Drank coffee, and uh, um, there was one of these second bite type things that we that I used to see once a week, and so. I was probably having about one or two meals a week, but I wasn't eating anything from there. Yeah. I, refu I was refusing to eat any of anything that they served. Um, you mentioned that, you, that there was a laundry service. When we met in June, I'll, I'll quote what you said to me then. Um, you said it was really hard getting your stuff back. Absolutely, yeah. You'd get other people's stuff maybe and your stuff would disappear. You had to be straight onto them so they could find where they'd gotten it from. Yeah. And was that your experience 
the whole. Oh, that was everybody's experience all the time. Yeah, um, yeah. You, I, I would only give them three or four things at a time to wash, so that I knew what was there. And I'd be straight on to as soon as it came back. I'd be straight on, make sure I got back what I gave them. Yeah. And if I had other people's stuff or stuff missing, I'd straight on to them. So who else's stuff did you just wash? And was they it must on, have my stuff, yeah. Was it on site? They washed on site? Yeah, it was on site. Yeah, they had a laundry. And, Could you go and use a laundry there? Um, no, but then towards the end, they had one girl that used to use the laundry, that they let use the laundry for some reason. But early on, no, we weren't allowed, yeah. There was a, a cordless phone handset there for residents. Yes. There. Uh, and did you use that or? Uh, when you could. I mean, yeah, sometimes, a lot of the time you, it was only the one phone and 25, 30 people. And so a lot of times someone else was using it or when they finished using it, it was left lying in their room and then you'd have to try and figure out who had it. Yeah. And then when you found it, it would be flat. And then other times there was times when it wasn't working and, it was two or three weeks that it wasn't working and people couldn't, you know, we couldn't call out. But, you know, and when people called in, they wouldn't pass on messages. Uh, oh, communication so, with the outside was terrible. Was yeah. there, a, there an office number as well? That, that, There's an office number for office calling in, yeah. Calling. But a lot of times, um, you know, people would call for me, my support worker, my brother, yeah. and, you know, and they wouldn't get through to me. And I think you mentioned when we last met in June something about the mail. You got an, you got some mail oh, for an appointment. I, I had an appointment at Western Health. For, I got given the letter saying, oh, you got a letter here, and I opened it up, and it was for an appointment a month ago, and the letter was dated a month before the appointment. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and, did that then, and then we saw earlier the photo of the piles of mail that they had sitting here. That was the, the same facility where we saw those photos earlier. Can I, and so really in terms of communication, you, with the outside world, you were able to come and go, but yeah. you relied on a mobile phone, I suppose. Yeah, well, I, I generally, I've got a mobile phone, but have prepaid a lot of the time. It's not even got charge on it, you know? So yeah, yeah, as, yeah, the only way to communicate was with your own phone though, yeah. yeah. For, for instance, if your brother yeah. wanted to contact you. Yeah how he do it or he either turn up at the door or <laughs> yeah he come yeah um can i just ask you fire safety did you ever have any fire drills in the five and a half years no no we had one time there was went out to the front porch and there was a lady there from co health that was talking to the proprietor and i heard her ask him about fire drills he said oh yeah yeah we have fire drills and so i chipped in and I said, when do we have fire drills he said oh Remember last month when the fire alarm went off? We counted that as a fire drill. That's not a fire drill. You didn't check, you know, who, who stayed in their rooms, who came out, or what did the staff do? Nothing, you know. It was just, yeah, it was just a fire alarm. <laughs> and you, you saw some photo, photo or a photo earlier of a of a locked front door. What do you know? What the e uh, with exit, the chain and the padlock? Yeah, but in terms of Grace Manor, when you were there. What was at night time? Could you, was the front door and any other door locked? They would lock the front out? door. Uh, there was a side door that we could always come in and out of right. even at night. And did you have a key for that? No, it was not, wasn't locked. Right. Yeah. So, so anyone we, could have walked in there? Yes. Uh, and the block's on a corner, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there's a, there's a drive, driveway and a, a gate to come through. Yeah. Was that gate closed at night? Do you remember? No. All right. Um, I you... mean, uh, yeah, he's recently put up the new fence that's got those gates on it. But before that, they didn't even have a gate on the fence. Right. They've always had a fence around it, have they? When you? Uh, yeah, the old fence was just posts with like a pipe rail across the top. So no no wire or anything. You could and, like walk through it. Yeah. And how high off the ground was it? Oh, you know, three yeah. feet, three feet sort three of thing, feet. yeah. You were there during the, the COVID, yes, uh, the COVID breakout and the lockdowns. Yes. Did it, how how did that affect you day to day when the lockdowns were on? Um, I was pretty lucky because the shops that I usually go to up the street were ones that weren't weren't locked down, right? weren't shut down by the lockdown. So I was pretty much able to get to the shops that I usually go to. Um, but where it did affect was all the like co health and advocates and all those sorts of people 
weren't coming in. Weren't able to come in. Yeah. yeah. So. And like Co-Health in particular, the, the guy from Co-Health I used to use as an, as an advocate sometimes right. when I had a beef with the proprietor. Yeah. But yeah. Um, you, you personally weren't able to do video calls or the like at that time? No. Okay. Um, I think you, what about vaccinations at the, at Grace Manor? Did that happen for COVID? Yeah, that was good. That was, they brought in some, uh, a team or whatever to do the needles. And so we were all able to get our shots and that. So that's one of the great things I think about the SRS is that things like that yeah. are, are really easily dealt with, you know? Yeah. And th was there anyone who came down with COVID? I think there was a, um, when Wintergam came in, there was one stage where somebody had tested positive at hospital. So they came around and gave us all a rat test. And then um, their second test came up negative. So it was all clear. Yeah. But yeah, I'm not aware of anybody there actually getting COVID. It's not a bad strike rate. Yeah, we, we were lucky. Um, you're, not, you're not living at Grace Manor anymore. No. Um, You've moved out in late June, I think. Yeah, uh, June 22nd, yeah. All right. And um, where are you living now? Currently in Deer Park. And how far away from Melton South is that? Uh, approximately 20 minutes. All right. And it's a four-bedder? Uh, yes, it's a four-bedroom yeah. house, yeah. And who are you living there with? No, obviously, um, the name names. Three other residents there that are there. Former residents? Of um, two of them are former residents from um, my... Uh, SRS, yeah, and the other one was from an, uh, the Sydney SRS, which was also part of that Grace. They're both Grace Disability. Yep. Um, yeah, and the other one, the other one was from there. Yeah. And is there on-site support? There is a, a worker there, twenty-four-seven. All right, and you don't need to know, tell me the details if you don't know them. But does NDIS? Do you, do you understand? Does some of your plan help with where you're living now, or you're not sure? Yeah, the funding for it comes out of NDIS, I believe. Yeah. Um, and uh, are you are you planning to stay there long term, or what's the plan? Well, I'm trying. I'm looking at getting back to Melton. We've found a place back in Melton to move back into because a lot of the services and that I'm used to and familiarity with town, but a lot of the services are there too. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to be back in there? The yeah. Um, we'll be moving back to Melton shortly after I go back home. Yeah. All right. And are you. Will that be with some of the fellows you're with in the... With one of the other guys, neither of us were happy with the Deer Park because we've um, you know, got about a 15-minute walk to the nearest bus stop yeah. and about a 20-minute walk to the train station sort of thing. So, yeah, you're basically stranded there. Yeah. Whereas what Melton South is a bus That's stop in out Deer the front. Park. And Melton, Melton South, yeah, there's plenty of bus routes. And there's a train stop. The, the place we've seen in Melton South is actually a little bit off the bus route, but it's at least there's nice straight grid pattern roads. I mean, the, the area in Deer Park is this, these new estates where all the houses are cramped together. It's the bendy roads where you veer off this way and veer off that way and you're going around in circles and don't know where you are. You know, I mean, like a 15 minute away bus stop, I wouldn't be able to find it. I'd probably get lost. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, whereas when you've got a straight grid pattern, you know, first left, second right, you know. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to um, quote again from something we talked about in June, and um, that's in terms of, I guess, your ideal housing. I asked you if, if I waved the magic wand and gave you the housing you wanted there and then, what would you have? You said, oh, look, if I had a magic wand I could wave, I would have had that place stay open. I think you meant Grace Manor. Yes. With different administrators. Yes. Uh, and do you mean by that, that mean Winteringham, you mean different managers is yeah, that right? Winteringham would have been great to run it <laughs> and then you said but then you've got to find a person that wants to take it over but yes yeah, yeah. one and half a dozen of the other a roof over the head that's all that matters yeah what else do you miss about Grace Manor what do you miss well, most about it the thing is like you'll find in in that 25 30 people most of them suffer from depression for a start and right one of the things with depression is you don't want to leave the home and so basically it's the only community they have contact with you know a lot of them uh, and you know you're bouncing off each other on you know there's a Centrelink payment coming out it's like oh have you heard about this payment do we get that or does right. that go to someone else and yeah you know, you there was a lot of 
cross-referencing of, you know, we all had similar interests because we're all on the, you know, pension or whatever. Yeah. And, yeah, so you had a lot of common interests where you could inform each other and yeah. get informed by others about what what have you heard, what, you know, what do you know, and, yeah, passed on like that. And like a lot of, like even with some of the residents, they sort of just got told what to do and they'd done it. And when they saw me fighting back, they sort of started saying, oh, we can complain, can we? You know, and they, they started jacking up, yeah. So you like that camaraderie? Yeah, it was great, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll move to the last topic I wanted to ask you about and then I'll hand over to the chair and the other commissioners. Mm -hmm. The last topic is, and we talked about this in June, about recommendations or changes from a higher level, top level. Um, one you spoke to me about that you'd like to recommend is that there should be scrutiny of proprietors or managers when they first open or they first register you didn't yeah. feel that that the people that were running it for you in your words i think were fit and proper that you oh, think there should not be a fit and proper person assessment or a yeah. screening I, is that right I, I don't think they were fit and proper to have any position in the care industry not even cleaning position yeah <laughs> the second topic you talked about a similar vein is that there should be regular auditing and uh, supervision yeah. by regulators of SRSs and those who uh, run them? Just Not just SRSs, but the whole SRS, NDIS, state trustee, yeah, just to overlook that whole thing, yeah. All right. And then lastly, probably evident from what you've already said, but improvements or oversight of the quality of food, meals, diet, yeah. maintenance for, for oh, residents. It's, yeah, it's fantastic. When a winter game came in, the proper food was being served, then, yeah, it was great. Was there anything, any other topic that I've missed that you wanted to suggest to the Royal Commission that they have a think about from your experience at the SRS? Uh, not because, I mean, it was an old place. It was a bit run down, but a lot of the people there, like, like me, were happy with a roof over their head, hot and cold running water. You know, the once a week cleaning, that's great, you know. Um, don't need much. We don't need a fancy place, a lot of us, you know, but so to be... Great if that place could have stayed open, but yeah, if it had stayed open, he actually those people actually owned the property, so they would have still been in the picture. <laughs> See, yeah. one other topic before I hand over. Sorry, um, you talked about some visitors coming to support and do some advocacy for you. Um, did the community visitor, the public advocate, come? to people from that that come from time to time? I think we talked about it um, in June. They came because I called them. Right. Uh, there was something up, put up on the notice board about the advocates and other, so I wrote down the number and yeah. got on to them, yeah. Yeah, and were you raising complaints with them about...? Yeah, they started coming in, and I, I just, yeah, any, anything that was going on, you'd have a chat to them about, yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Those are my questions for Jacob. Thank you, uh, Thanks, Jacob. Mr Fogarty. Thank you, Jacob. If uh, it's all right with you, I'll ask first Commissioner Gelbel if she has any questions for you. Um, thank you very much. Um, with CoHealth, so what was their arrangement? You, you said that they'd come and come to the door and they were a sort of an advocate. Um, what were, were they appointed as an advocate? Did you have an No, the CoHealth, he used to come in and um, yeah, he'd he chat to people to see how they were going and everything, but he also organised day trips and that, like, you know, Get, get us together and go to Werribee Park or something, you know. Um, so, yeah, he was mainly there for that, but because he was familiar with how the place was running and everything, and I, I just, and because he was a good communicator, I just made use of him as an advocate because there was no one else like that around. Right. But you're not quite sure how that arrangement happened, whether that No, was... they were coming in already there when I first oh. came there, yeah. Um, with the NDIS team that you've now got, did you select them? Have you? Have you? No, seen no, that was good fortune. I, but I did go through. We went through a couple of other, like and now I'm with Melbourne City Mission, mm -hmm. but we went through a couple of other ones before that, and we just weren't getting much, really good communication back. So we sort of changed it, and yeah, with with Melbourne City Mission, I've got a great coordinator. Yeah. And with the four-bedroom house in Deer Park that you're living in now, but you're moving to Melton, 
Um, do you have to do your own cooking and cleaning there? How does that? No, work? that's why they have someone there twenty four seven. They so do the cooking and cleaning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and you're, they're, you're they're generally there for to make sure we're safe. Yeah. Right, so, yeah. Right. And then your NDIS team come in and work with you. My support worker comes a couple of times a week. Yeah, and I go out with her. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for. Thank you. I'll ask uh, Commissioner Rupp. I have no questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Jacob, thank, thank you very you. much for giving evidence. Thank you for thank you. the interview that you did earlier on uh, with uh, Mr. Fogarty. I think uh, your evidence is uh, very helpful to, you, to us, and we very much appreciate the assistance you've provided to the Royal Commission. So thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Fogarty. It's, as I understand it, it's uh, a lunch break. Yes, so we should now adjourn. It's now about one thirty-seven. Let's uh, at twelve thirty-seven. Let's adjourn till one thirty-five. Thank you, Chair. The Royal Commission is adjourned. Commissioners, the next witness um, goes by the name of Belle and she'll be with us in a moment and I apologise uh, for the slight confusion. Uh, it might be indeed best if I... Um, to propose to adjourn for just two minutes. I apologise, Commissioners, if we no could problem. just have two minutes to get the room ready properly. Right, OK. Well, we'll save up the knock so they can be used again. Thank you, sir. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is now resumed. Yes, yes, Bernard. Thank you, Commissioners. Commissioners, this is Belle, and Belle would like to tell you about herself and about where she lives. Uh, so, Belle, you're 34 years old, is that right? Can you try and say a big yes for me? Good work. Now, you live with uh, some depression and anxiety and uh, borderline personality disorder. Is that right? Yeah. And they make some things a bit hard for you sometimes? Yeah. Okay. Tell us about the things that you like doing, Belle. Can you tell us that um, you like watching television? What kind of television do you like to watch? If we... Yeah. Do you like Stranger Things? Yeah. What about Riverdale? Yeah. Have you seen the new season? Yeah. Excellent. Um, do you like, you like going out with some of your support workers sometimes? Yeah. And they take you to the hills? Yeah. Where else do they take you sometimes? Uh, to my... Friends, coffee shop. Coffee. You like coffee? Who wouldn't? That's a great answer. <laughs> You're true. crazy if you don't. I agree with you. I ain't going. And do you like to have coffee most days then? Yes. Just the one? Are you freaking kidding me? No. <laughs> I think you say in your, in your statement you're a total coffee addict. Is that right? Yeah. Great. Now, you get some help from some support workers that are funded by the NDIS, is that right? So you have a psychologist and an occupational therapist. Yeah. 
And you find they help you a lot? Yeah. You like talking to your psychologist? Yeah. That's great. Um, now you've, you've lived, you live in an SRS, is that right? Yes. Do you know how much money you pay to live in an SRS? $920. $920, is it? Yeah. Every fortnight? Yeah. And you get your own room and bathroom, is that right? Yeah. And do you have much money left over after the $920 a fortnight? No. Um, at the house you live in, do you what do you like to do there? Do you like to watch TV there? Yeah. Can you watch Netflix in your own room? No. No? Is there any Netflix in your room? No. Is there some Netflix in the common area? Yeah. And how many people do you share the SRS with? How many people live at your SRS, do you think, roughly? Um, 30 to 40 people. And are they older than you or younger than you? All right, let me ask that again. Yes. Are they, <laughs> are, they uh, are they mainly a bit older than you? Don't want older. Yeah. Does it make it a bit hard to make friends sometimes? Yes, but I don't like them anyway. <laughs> and um, is the SRS you live in, does it, is it clean and tidy? Mm. And when you moved in there, I think you said that you'd need some help to, from the SRS to keep your room tidy, didn't you? Is that right? Yeah. And can, do you mind, Belle, if I show a couple of photos of your room? Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. I'll ask the operators to throw, show um, Exhibit 1, which is doc, um, 0003. You'll see it comes up on this screen. It's a picture of your room. Mm -hmm. And that's what it looked like most of the time until pretty recently. Is that right? Could you say yes? Yeah. Or, yeah, is that right? And did you find it pretty hard to get help to tidy it up? Yeah. Did you want it to be a bit tidier than that? Yeah. So they asked the operator to show 0006. Is that also your room? Yep. And it looked like that until pretty recently, didn't it? Yeah. And I think when your lawyer asked for some sheets recently, you got given some sheets, is that right? Yeah. So you've had sheets on your bed for the last few weeks, is that right? Yeah. So, Miss Bennett, are we talking about the share house or no, SRSB? This is the SRS where Bell's living at the moment. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll ask the operator to bring that photo down. Um, you've slept on a bed without sheets at times for weeks at a time, haven't you? Has it been a bit hard to get what you've asked for sometimes? Always. You sometimes wish that you could have some sheets for your bed a bit more? Yeah. Do you feel like you get a lot of support at the SRS for cleaning your room and washing your sheets and things? No. Does that make you a bit sad? Not that, but angry. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> about the food, is the kitchen, can you go to the kitchen whenever you want at your SRS? 
No. Is it is it open whenever you want to go and make yourself a snack? No. When is there food for you at the SRS? Um, breakfast, lunch, bit of afternoon tea and dinner. And do you get to choose the sort of food you want to eat? No. What sort of food would you like to choose to eat? Um, I want to be on a fruit and veggie diet. I like to eat more fruits and vegetables? Do you not get many at the moment? None at all. You don't get much of a choice about what's on the menu? No. What if you sleep through a meal? Do you still get to catch it up? No. You just miss breakfast? If you miss breakfast, you miss breakfast. Um, you've got some medication that you take to help you sometimes, is that right? Um, yeah, every lunchtime. Yeah. And, and the SRS is meant to keep your medication for you and help you to have it at the right time. Is that right? Or do you keep it yourself? Um, they keep it to me at lunchtime. And is that okay? Do you normally, um, do you get your medication when you need it? Sometimes it's like a struggle. <laughs> Do you know the people you can go to when you're having a bit of a struggle with getting your medication? Yeah. yeah. And they um good answer. You want more? There's something you want to tell the commissioners, Bill? It's okay. All right. Okay. Um, now, this isn't the first time that, I'm oh, sorry, before you go there, what, you, you need some help to shower sometimes, don't you? Um, all the time, yeah. Yeah. And, and you'd like it if you could just have a female worker to help you with that, wouldn't you? Yeah. And... Do you have female staff at the SRS who can help you to do that? Um, she just recently um, decided not to. Does that make it hard for you to have showers when you want to? Makes it hard to keep yourself as clean as you want to. Now, this isn't the first SRS, or before I do that, you sometimes feel like it's, you don't feel safe at your SRS. Um, yeah. Sometimes you get a bit scared of people coming in and out. You let me know if you need a break. Would you like to have a little break? Are you okay? Yeah, we should mm -hmm. talk with you. Would you like to have a little break? Are you okay to, to go on? Yeah. Keep okay. going. Yeah. yeah, keep going. Did you have a break? No. Okay. Doing really well. Doing super well. Sort of house. You've lived in other SRSs before, is that right? Yes. You've lived in a few over the last six years, is that right? What sort of house do you think you'd like to live in in the future? Do you think you'd like to live in a group home? Yeah. 
You say in your statement, I often think I'd rather live on the streets than continue to live at an SRS. Is that right? Is that how you feel sometimes? I always feel like that at the moment. You always feel like that at the moment. I think you say as well that you would like to live um, in a group home where you could have much less people around. Is that right? So yeah, someone recently told you you might be able to live in a house that would be shared with three or four other women and that you could live there. Yeah. Is that the sort of thing you'd like? Yeah. You think you'd need some support to be able to do that? Yeah. yeah. You say in your statement, you think a lot of people try and mute people with disability. Is that how you feel? Yeah. Is there anything you'd like to say to the commissioners about what you'd like for yourself or other people who are in your situation? You don't have to. Um, like actually listen and, and like consider us like um, our feelings. You want people to consider your feelings? Do you feel like people don't consider your feelings at the moment very much? No. Is there anything, is there anything else that you would like to tell the commissioners while they're listening to you today? They have your statement and they've read, they've read your statement. Anything you want to tell them while they're here? Um, that staff are rude. Staff are rude to you sometimes? Well, at the moment, like, it's being rude to me. Some of the staff are rude to you some, all the time? Yeah. You don't feel respected? It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Everything's okay. There's a button. It's okay. There's a button. Everything's okay. Everything's okay. You just talk to the commissioners. They want to hear from you. They want to hear from you. What else? Um. I think that um, my anxiety and my depression is like bad because like, like for example, like I'll ask them to do my washing and then like, um, they'll say the door and then I come home and it's not done. And then like, I just like end up yelling and screaming and um, swear at them because they just don't basically do what um, I ask unless like I get to the point where like, I scream and like tell them off and swear. And you wish you could just, and you wish you could have a, a good and respectful relationship with the people that you live with. I just wish they would do their flipping job properly. Because then no one back like this. Um 
And that's been your experience in most of the SRSs you've, you've lived at is you've, you've found them difficult when you've lived in them. Usually you're the youngest in an SRS, is that right? Oh. So it can be hard when you're the youngest. It's okay. Well, those are the questions I wanted to ask you today. Mm -hmm. But I want to make sure if there's anything else you want to say to the commissioners. So they've got your statement. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you'd like to tell them about yourself? That sometimes I don't understand like um what's like um, like just up and down emotions like it's hard to pinpoint like what's actually going on and you'd like to live somewhere where there's a bit more support for you is that right yeah, like I feel like I don't know, like it it might not happen, but if I'm having a meltdown, like um they'll probably like listen to me and and ask me like what I need, so like if I need space or like probably give it to me, like I need like them just to be there, they'll probably, like, be there. And that hasn't always happened in an SRS. You haven't always felt like you've got that support. Yeah, like, especially, um, especially now that me and okay. are the big. Yeah, don't worry. It's okay. Please don't worry about it. I want to hear what you have to say, don't worry. No. Um, there's, a, there's a magic button, don't worry about that. Um, now that, like, I put um, stuff, memory keeps me of saying something and that's not what I meant and I tried to, like, explain to her and then, like, she just, um wasn't listening, so to speak. I just, um, like, pretty much, um, like, she got me that, like, angry because, like, I felt like she wasn't listening, so, like, I'm, like, in my head, I've got two choices. I've got a hot boiling coffee in my head, hand, and I could throw it at her, or I could put it down, and walk out for a swing, and I chose to put it down, but then she was like following me and like screaming at me, and I'm like, um, don't follow me because like I'm seriously about to punch you in the face. And she just like wouldn't expect, like, she didn't, like, she just kept following me. Commissioners, those are the questions I was going to ask Belle this morning. Um, I don't know if the commissioners have any questions for her. Well, uh, Belle, what we usually do is to ask uh, the commissioners, and there are three commissioners. One is uh, Commissioner Galvely, and you can see Commissioner Galvely on the screen up there. She's in Melbourne. She just waved to you. And then there's Commissioner Ryan, who's sitting here with me. I'm Commissioner Sackville, and I'm the, I, I'm the chair of the Royal Commission. We usually ask uh, if, will we, if there are questions. Are you happy if the commissioners want to ask you a question? Is that okay with you? Are you mm -hmm. sure? All yeah. right, well, then I'll ask Commissioner Galbally, whom you can see on the screen, and ask if she has any questions for you. And just take your time 
in answering, okay? First, we'll have to get Commissioner Galbally to unmute herself, <laughs> and then she'll ask a question. I think you're on mute. All right. I'd just like to thank you um, very much for coming and, you know, I found it really inform very valuable and informative. Thank you very much. Okay, and I'll ask Commissioner Ryan, who's just here. I don't have any questions for you, Bill, but I do want to say a very, very, very big thank you to you for coming in and telling us about how you live. It's a very important thing you've done, and I'm very, very grateful you've done it. Thank you very much. And, Bill, I am also very grateful to you when we read your statement, we were very keen for you to come and talk to us directly so that we could see you and you could see us. And we're very glad that you did that because we've been able to hear from you the things that are important to you and what you have experienced in your life uh, uh, in recent years. So we're very, very grateful to you for coming to us. Thank you, thank you so much. We do appreciate and you've, the big help that you've been to the Royal Commission. So thank you very much. Commissioners, sorry, Bill. I'm just gonna say something to the commissioners. Um, so commissioners, uh, I'm sorry that we also omitted uh, to invite Belle's lawyer to announce her appearance and that she's here. And Ms. Block also uh, represented and assisted Jacob this morning. So I don't know whether Ms. Block wants to if say you anything like to, to you. Commissioners your appearance honest. retrospectively, please. <laughs> so Belle, I just thought probably uh, to tell the commissioners that you had your own lawyer as well. So we'll ask Natalie to do that. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Block, initial N, and I appeared for Belle and for Jacob this morning. Thank you very much for announcing your appearance, and thank you very much for assisting both Jacob and Belle. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. And commissioners, you've got Belle's written um, statement, and Belle's got a copy, a big size copy of her statement there as well. And we also thank to uh, support Bell today. So Bell, if it's okay with you, I might ask the commissioners if they can take a little bit of a break and leave the room, and then you can stay here as long as you like, and then we can let the commissioners know when we can come back. Is that okay? And a big thank you from the Royal Commission. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, Bell. We'll, we'll, we'll take a short break now. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is now resumed. Yes, uh, Ms. Bowsett. Thank you, Chair. The next witness and our final witness for today is Dr. Colleen Pearce. Dr. Pearce, welcome back to the Royal Commission. Thank you. For a uh, repeat appearance. Uh, thank you again for uh, assisting the Royal Commission this time without the benefit of an additional statement. We've had two statements from you previously. Um, I understand that, that you wish to take the affirmation. If you'd be good enough to follow the instructions of my associate, he will administer the affirmation to you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. 
Uh, Dr. Pierce, I'm sure you know where everybody is, but just to reiterate, Commissioner Galbally, whom you can see on screen, is joining the hearing from Melbourne, and Commissioner Ryan is on my left, and of course, Ms. Dowsett is in the same room, and I will now ask Ms. Dowsett to ask you some questions. Thank you, Chair. Dr. Pierce, when you were last before the Royal Commission in public hearing 20, you were then coming towards the end of your appointment, but in September 2021, you were reappointed for a third seven-year term as public advocate. That's correct. And although, as the Chair noted, you haven't prepared a statement in preparation for giving evidence today, you have read all of the transcripts of this hearing? Yes. And you, so you're able to answer any questions that when we get to them, the commissioners might want to put to you about the other evidence. I'll do my best. Thank you. I'd like to pick up by beginning with a point that you referred us to in public hearing 20. And at that time, you described it as an emerging issue relating to private rental accommodation. Now, you gave us an example in public hearing 20 about a resident who was moved from an SRS to private rental accommodation with a $600,000 NDIS plan that was exhausted within the space of seven months. Do you remember that example? I do. And as I understand it, you would like to tell the Royal Commission about how this emerging, then emerging problem continues to be an issue. Mm. Look, it continues to be a very significant issue, and you've heard evidence already about people disappearing from uh, SRSs and where did they go and how do we find them. But I want to just give you um, two examples that have come to my attention in the last few weeks about new forms of emerging accommodation. And uh, the first one um, is a, has 13 rooms. One room is a shed in the backyard with no power or natural light. Two very small rooms, two medium rooms. One larger room, however, this would be considered still small um, by a standard double bedroom. Only one small bathroom for all 13 rooms. Two toilets. A large separate open plan kitchen. No, no living or communal areas inside the property and the charges range from $100 to $350 a week. The second is um, eight rooms, charging between 300 Sorry, if we can just pause there. Are you yes. able to tell us what uh, a, a person who was paying those amounts actually got for the monies they were paying per week? Well, this is the problem with these um, new and emerging models. It's who is responsible and who can ask and find out those kinds of questions? Because it's not an SRS. Well, it could be an SRS, but at the moment it's operating as an unregulated, potentially an unregulated um, SRS. Um, it's possible and entirely likely that some of the people living in those uh, rooms are NDIS participants, but no one has automatic right of entry to ask the questions, who are these people? Who are they living there? The reason I know they're charged between $150 a week is because um, state trustees alerted me um, to these uh, properties and they have residents that are living there. They're very concerned about them. Um, and, uh, but really they're there as the administrator, so to pay some bills. Um, they're concerned about what else um, they might find there. So the question is, these new um, and emerging forms of accommodation uh, sit outside the regulatory system, or perhaps could be part of the regulatory system, if uh, we knew uh, what they were and who's living here. So with SRSs, as we've been discussing, or at least hearing evidence about, there is a regulatory system in place. Yes. And uh, some of the evidence may suggest that that regulatory system hasn't been as effective as it might have been in Victoria, but maybe there's another view about that uh, 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 that we might uh, hear something about later on. But what you're indicating is that it is open to somebody to set up what amounts to a boarding house, uh, in this case with 13 rooms without being a registered SRS 
once that is done, there is no agency, as I understand what you're saying, who has the power to enter those premises, inspect them and hold them to account if there is some breach of uh, basic standards of cleanliness. My understanding is that the regulator, in order to establish whether or not it is in fact an unregulated um, SRS, uh, would need to, um, can either knock on the door and seek entry or would need to get a search warrant to enter. So they could enter um, the premises uh, to ascertain whether or not it is in fact, um, should be regulated as an SRS. But these processes take a considerable amount of time. So once they are able to uh, enter, they'd need to um, then, if it is a, a SRS, unregulated SRS, then they'd need to prosecute. Um, so all of this takes a lot of time. So, but do I understand from what you're saying that let us take this 13 room yep. accommodation to which you've referred without uh, specifying where it is, a accommodation of that kind or the owner thereof, would is that owner obliged to register it as an SRS or is it open to the owner to say, I don't want to have anything to do with SRSs or any registration system. I'm just operating in the private market and if people want to come and live in my boarding house and pay $350 a week, that's a matter for them. Well, I think uh, under normal circumstances, one would expect people to um, register to become an SRS, but what we're seeing is an explosion of different forms of accommodation, and therefore, um, whether they're unaware that they need to register or they're just flouting the rules, I no, wouldn't that, know. That's my question. Are they obliged as a matter of law to register and they're ignoring the law, or are they able to operate legally without registering? I, I, it's a question that the regulator would be able to give you an accurate answer, but I believe they should be obliged they would be obliged to register. I understand the normative proposition yes. that they should be, but we'll need to ask the regulator yes, I think what's the actual position. Okay. Yes. Um, excuse me, could I just ask a question? I'm assuming that there are people with disabilities living in there, and we know that for sure? We don't know that for sure. We know that um, if state trustees involved, that means that they're an administrator, and that means they would have been appointed by VCAT, and therefore we can assume that at least a number of those people who are residing in these premises are people with disability. Otherwise, you wouldn't have had a, um, an administrator appointed. Yes. Uh, the, other, the other point I'd like yeah. to make is that um, with a regulated SRS, community visitors can visit and um, community visitors, uh, as you've heard in uh, evidence at other hearings, are very diligent about raising issues. So there is no community visitors, there's no, no one from outside going in to see what's happening. Um, the NDIS, if they're um, Quality and Safeguarding Commission, if there's a person uh, with an, on an NDIS plan, um, they could perhaps have some oversight, but firstly, they'd need to know who lives there and there'd need to be a complaint. Um, and without knowing who's living there, what are the circumstances, there's no external people going in, the regulator um, doesn't have oversight. Um, so there are all of these new forms of accommodation that um, are we call popping up um, that are um, outside of the norms and outside of the current regulatory frameworks. For a resident of this hypothetical facility we're talking about, to obtain services from the entity running uh, the facility, and if that entity is unregistered either under the State Act or under the NDIS scheme, it would have to be a self-managed plan, wouldn't it, for that to happen? Because if it were an agency managed plan, then the service provider would have to be registered. Ah, uh, yes, that's correct. What we're finding, it's, had, it's been a recurring theme in this hearing, is that there are so many intersecting arrows <laughs> in this area between Commonwealth and state, one scheme, another scheme, one system of regulation, another system of regulation. Very difficult to piece them all together. And it must be very, very difficult for people who aren't uh, accustomed to thinking through uh, 
how regulatory schemes operate or are meant to be op operate. Mm. That's, it, that's exactly right. And I think there is, uh, in Victoria, there are a large number of agencies who have some form of responsibility um, in the disability and mental health space. Yeah. But the difficulty is there's no one who has sole uh, or, or oversight. Um, and it's a significant um, gap in the regulatory system. All right, Ms. Bowser, you're on again. Thank you, Chair. Um, you did say that there were two examples. I will ask you if you, you want briefly to share the second example that's come to your attention and just indicate to the Royal Commission how that one came to your attention. Uh, again, state trustees raised um, this uh, matter with uh, my office uh, because they were concerned about what was happening in these facilities. The second one is eight rooms charging between $350 and $500 per week. The property previously had a lounge room. However, this has been turned into two bedrooms. Downstairs has one bathroom servicing all of the eight rooms. One of the rooms is a caravan in the sideway of the house. And State Trustees has one uh, client residing in this property who lives in the garage, which has been split into two rooms. So state, state trustees have brought this to your attention. What can you, what can your office do? Um, very little. Community visitors can't um, visit. Uh, I don't have own motion powers to go in and have a look at what's happening in these facilities. I know state trustees has raised that with the regulator. So um, is there a regulatory um, option? I remain very concerned about who is living there, under what circumstances. Um, you know, I, I could try uh, knocking on their door, but if um, uh, uh, my office is refused entry, then at this point in time, I don't know any of the names of the people living there. I don't know if they have disabilities. I don't know if they're in receipt of NDIS packages. So there's uh, very little that uh, my office can do in these circumstances. Where, where does the state trustee fit in? So you said this has been drawn to your attention by the state trustee. Yes, state trustees are the administrator. Uh, of, for, of, of the estate of the particular person. For, for one person in the second example, and I think it was perhaps two in the first example. Yes. And the trustee is troubled by the economy. Very troubled. Why don't they do something about it? Well, they have. They've brought it to my office and they've but brought it to the- You can't do anything about it. Just... And, uh, but uh, this, is, this is a common problem. Um, they've raised it with the regulator. So everybody gets concerned and tries to raise it um, with the appropriate body. But in fact, who has um, the um, overall responsibility? And just, just recently, um, in the last week, I um, released a report called Line of Sight, uh, Refocusing Victoria's um, Adult Safeguarding System. And I made a number of recommendations there for dealing with the gaps in the regulatory system. And the um, cornerstone rec recommendation is for the Victorian government to introduce adult safeguarding legislation to establish a new specialist adult safeguarding function uh, to enable an agency to receive and assess reports of abuse, neglect and exploitation of at-risk um, at adults via a helpline, undertake investigations and make and coordinate referrals to other agencies. So that's what's needed. But just let's come back to the trustee for a moment. I know you are not the trustee. We're talking about a trustee who's been appointed to safeguard the interests, including the finances of the relevant person. Yes. And the trustee is discharging its, his, her obligations by reporting it to you, but you lack the powers to do very much about it. One might have thought that if that's the situation, and I don't know all the facts, obviously, but one might have thought that the trustee perhaps should be doing something a bit more active to ensure that the person for whom they're ultimately responsible in the sense of uh, looking after their welfare or ascertaining their uh, wishes, uh, they, that they should be doing something to ensure that the accommodation they're in is actually safe, appropriate, accessible and so on. Look, in fairness to state trustees, I think they are doing um, as much as I think they can. They're raising it with me, they're raising it with the regulator. I have no doubt they've raised it with the Quality and Safeguarding Commission, but they themselves don't have powers 
um, to, uh, you know, if a person says, as you've heard, I want to stay in this facility. Um, but we don't, well, we don't know what the person yes. said. Yes, we don't know what their what their views are, and under the uh, under the, which circumstances that they've. How are these people finding these places? Why are they being moved? Thank you, Chair. I'd like to to change topics just a little now and talk about the the overlap or intersection between services provided in an SRS, and let, let's go back to registered SRSs now, the kind we've been hearing about. So SRS services and NDIS, reasonable and necessary supports. And you've previously, um, your office and the community visitors have expressed concern about, about the overlap and the lack of transparency. And I, I wonder if you can explain to the, to the Royal Commission what, what lies at the heart of that concern and what it is that your office um, is hearing about these issues? Mm. Well, um, I wonder if I could um, just give two examples, um, just because I think they support um, Bell's testimony and some of the other testimony that you um, heard um, earlier today. And um, a service provider, uh, oh, sorry, an advocacy organisation, contacted my office talking about a 34-year-old um, male with um, schizophrenia uh, and attention deficit um, disorder living in an SRS. Um, during the COVID lockdown, he signed a document. Uh, he wasn't sure what it was. He didn't have a copy of that. Um, what it ultimately did was uh, change his support coordinator. He was now... Um, uh, and he didn't know how that had occurred. It meant he, the support worker that he had, that he was very happy with, he no longer had. He found that he was being charged uh, $3,000 a month for support services, which he told the advocacy organisation he didn't think he was getting. And he said, I would rather sleep rough than stay in this SRS. And the advocacy organisation had said, well, look, you know, stay there and we're trying to find you alternative accommodation. So this is the choice, you know, homelessness. Um, and he said he was very angry uh, about what had happened to him. The second one, and these, these examples are just... Before you move on to that second example, mm -hmm. if we could just... So the advocacy organisation have raised this with yes. your office. Mm -hmm. What can you do? Well, they've asked us for advice as to what uh, they could do. And, uh, you know, we've suggested that uh, they, uh, uh, they know the details uh, so that uh, approach the regulator and take the case to the uh, Quality and Safeguarding Commission. And so does it, does it feel to you like you're, you've become something of the traffic cop, like people come to you and you're directing them to places of people with power and authority? We get multiple uh, phone calls um, every week uh, around concerns about people with a disability and whether they're in an SRS or living in the community. Um, uh, we get those and um, my office doesn't have the power uh, necessarily to act on um, these circumstances. And you heard Winteringham say that um, sometimes uh, they uh, apply for guardianship and they talked about nine cases where they applied um, for guardianship because they felt they had no other alternative. And certainly if I'm the guardian, then there are a range of uh, powers and, that I would have and I could um, seek information, uh, or more detailed information. But the question is, is guardianship, which is a limitation on a person's human rights, the most appropriate mechanism for ensuring that people get access to the kinds of services that they need. And I often describe um, applications for guardianship as being instrumental. So they're used to ensure a person gets access to the services they need. And it might be simply the signing of NDIS contracts. And uh, if we take a human rights view um, of uh, the disability uh, landscape and people with disability, then um, we should not be appointed as guardians for these instrumental reasons. 
But as Winteringham has said, it's once you get a guardian, perhaps, you know, there's the power of my office to try and assist uh, individuals. But we already have a waiting list for people um, under guardianship uh, for me to delegate my guardianship powers. So it's, it's very long. Um, but uh, sometimes that's the only alternative. Thank you. If you could tell us about the second example you wanted. Oh, yes. Uh, the second in example is um, a person with um, uh, mental health issues and um, has a support worker. Uh, and during COVID, it was very difficult to uh, get into SRSs, so um, they rang. The person, you know, they couldn't speak to the person over the phone uh, for a variety of reasons. So then, similar to the Hamilton House, they tried to meet the person in the garden, um, outdoors, uh, and uh, there were problems um, in doing that. And then uh, the professional support worker is attacked by the SRS provider saying they're unprofessional. Then the client is told, well, your person isn't reliable. They don't turn up. Perhaps you should use our services, uh, the uh, NDIS services provided um, uh, by the uh, SRS or associated companies. And particularly over COVID, when Victoria experienced long periods of lockdown and people weren't able to enter um, SRSs, I think that's when uh, we saw a transference of uh, a significant amount of transference of from outside providers to um, services either run by or associated with an SRS because people needed support and uh, there was an, a business opportunity there. And does your office have any, any ability to see when there is an entity, either the SRS itself or a related entity being the NDIS provider? Is there something you can see that gives you visibility of that? No. Um, you know, uh, uh, there was a period when there was a lot of um, issues in the West, both with SRSs and the pop-up houses. And, you know, I was doing some, or my office was doing some company searches. So we're trying to kind of match, well, who are these people? Where are they going? You know, when they're being moved out of SRSs, are they being moved to associated companies? But I think there's a bit of a labyrinth um, between, uh, you know, trying to find out this information. There's a lack of transparency. Uh, and if my office has to uh, go to that extent to try and understand it. And frankly, we don't have the time most of the time to do that. What about the person? You know, what about, the, you know, who's in receipt of the services and their agency? What do they know? Is there information available in, in easy read? What is their real choice and control? And it is, it is an illusion of choice and control. And it's really, they, they don't have um, much opportunity to actually really choose um, who should be providing NDIS supports to them. There are a range of documents that community visitors are allowed to see when they go to an SRS, that's correct? Yes. And that includes the ongoing support plan? Yes. It doesn't include if uh, the resident is also an NDIS participant, you're not entitled as a right to see the NDIS plan? That's correct. If the, the participant consents, can you see yes. their plan? Have you ever had opportunity to compare an NDIS plan and an SRS ongoing support plan or, and the residential agreement to see the overlap in services? Community visitors do attempt to do that. Um, but I do want to say that community visitors um, their role, remember they're volunteers, um, and their role is to uh, be there for the individuals, for the residents, and to monitor and report. And you're talking about a complicated process. They do desperately try to understand and get access to those documents. Um, but it, it is very difficult for them to uh, do all of that in the space of a visit. Uh, particularly when uh, the support plans in uh, SRSs are usually very skimpy and you heard some evidence today about what might be in a support plan and that's probably pretty typical, um, inadequate support plans. So it's, it is very difficult to see that, um, that overlap. But community visitors are very concerned and very suspicious 
and hence um, really the raising of all of these issues is uh, both in their annual reports with the Quality and Safeguarding Commission with the regulator over a very long period of time. If you look at it, uh, the community visitors annual reports, um, that's what they do. They try and report that to the appropriate body who can take the action. Um, I want to come back to that, but just finishing on um, what community visitors can yep. do. Uh, you were talking uh, when we spoke in preparation for you giving evidence about what community visitors have reported to you that they've observed about uh, people who are present in SRSs and are identified by the residents as support workers. Can you, and they're, what, what it appears that they're doing while they're present on the premises. Can you oh, talk about that? So um, the, there's a raise, range of things that community visitors might see. So for example, um, SRSs are, shouldn't be, but are open. So with the um, NDIS, um, and, and more service providers, you have a whole range of people wandering in and out of SRSs that say we're um, uh, support workers, but they're not badged. You don't know who they are, where they're from, wandering in and out of the facility. Um, and uh, community visitors, because they visit and they know people, they say, who's that in the lounge room? And they'll go, oh, that's that's the support worker sitting there on their phone. You know, that's um, that's that is certainly something that's been reported to me. Otherwise, community visitors might say um, uh, that uh, the person providing the NDIS supports is the same person that is on the roster for the SRS as a, a providing care in the SRS. So it's the same person. So again, it's the lack of transparency. How do you know when they're providing uh, support services for the SRS and how do you know when they're the NDIS worker? And just, sorry, just one other thing. You asked about um, what do community visitors see? Um, have they seen a change in, um, uh, in the residential agreements? And th those residential agreements, again, can be um, very scant on detail. But one of the things community visitors have been reporting, and it is about showering, um, is that um, in the past, residents might have been assisted to shower, so it would say assistance with showering, and now that is a reminder that you need to shower when previously it might have been actually assisting a person physically wash. Um, and now if you want assistance with showering, it comes out of your NDIS plan. So this is something you might have heard Commissioner Ryan talking about earlier today, that potential for rebadging, mm, I think exactly. that's his language. Exactly. Now you were you spoke about the community visitors annual reports and their the, the reports that you and your office make to the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission. If I could perhaps start with the annual report. So this is a, a report that you make to the government or that community visitors make to the government. And then what is supposed to happen from there? So um, the reports are uh, tabled in parliament and there is an understanding that government will respond to community visitors annual reports uh, within 12 months. So, or, or one would expect given the seriousness of the, uh, of the issues that are raised, um, but the, uh, uh, might, quite, might not get this right, the uh, 1920 report, it took 18 months for the government to respond. Um, and the 2021, it's been about nine months and we expect because of the election, it might be um, you know, 15 months before they actually respond um, to the community visitor and your reports. So you've got this incredible wealth of information and I'm, I know that you will have looked at it and uh, you look over the last three years, um, what they've been saying about the NDIS and the problems uh, with this lack of transparency, uh, double dipping and potentially um, you know, fraudulent behavior and it takes 18 months to get the last response to the community visitors um, annual report. When and we were 
the, the latest one is um, nine months. And as I said, because of the election, we're anticipating that it could take up to 15 months. When we were talking about the Victorian government regulator response, you described that response, or you, you said it could be characterised by the initials B, H and A, H, where they stand for before Hambleton and after Hambleton. Would you like to explain to the Royal Commission what you mean by that? Mm. Well, um, community visitors had been raising issues about Hambleton House and the others, but particularly Hambleton House for a number of years. They had taken photographs, they had shown photographs similar to the ones that you saw, um, and they'd shown them over time to say, this is, you know, six, three months, six months, you know, it's the same, the furniture is deteriorating. And the regulator kept saying that, um, no, they're compliant, they're compliant. Um, and uh, the community visitors were being abused by the proprietor. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a line in the sand, really, when it comes to abusing uh, the community visitors in the manner that they were being treated at Hamilton House. It was quite unacceptable. Uh, to cut a long story short, um, you know, we, we did a um, report uh, to government about Hamilton House, but it wasn't until COVID struck and they were wandering around uh, leafy Albert Park and the COVID task force went in that suddenly Hambleton House was found to be non-compliant. And I don't care what the regulator or anyone says about it being compliant. We have pictures of people, um, bed bugs, bites on their arms. The story of... Um, the person who said they were cold. We, we, we had a woman who told us she slept in her coat in her bed because she was so cold at night. Um, so uh, I think the regulator uh, was, I would say, before Hamilton House was characterised by an unwillingness to exert its uh, meagre regulatory powers. And now we see after Hamilton House uh, a willingness to be more proactive um, more assertive, um, at signing a protocol with the community visitors. So there is really a marked difference between what happened before and what we see happening now. My issue is not that they're not acting now because we're seeing them with the closure of um, facilities and other action um, that is being taken. It's the length of time that it takes to uh, take regulatory action even if they're determined to take it, because cases have to be prepared, they have to go to VCAT, then they have to, you know, there may be an appeal. So it's a very long process, um, eating up a lot of resources, and there's a hundred and whatever SRSs. So all of this takes up a lot of time and resources. So the regulatory system, in my view, is not agile, it's not nimble, it's very difficult to move quickly. Um, and as uh, the service system is evolving quickly since the advent of NDIS, the regulatory system or the safeguarding or the over oversight system isn't nimble. They can't move quickly. And that's why we say, where are these people? Who's responsible? Who can find where these people have gone? I'm a bit confused here. You, you're talking about, when you talk about the government, you're talking about the Victorian government. Yes, yes, I am. Sorry. In your annual report, you also report writing to the um, NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission yes. in February 2021. Yes. And uh, that's 18 months ago. Uh, yes, um, so we wrote to, um, you know, what, what, what do community visitors do? They report to the regulator. They raise issues with the Quality and Safeguarding Commission. So I wrote to the Quality and Safeguarding Commission uh, concerned about seven um, SRSs, some of which were later closed, but not as a result of that letter. And it took a very long time to get a response from the commission around um, what 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 was um, what was what was their uh, approach. Um, and indeed, it's limited by the information sharing provisions. So. I tell these stories, I write to the commission, and there's very lim limited information that I get back. So I'm never really clear um, when I write to the Quality and Safeguarding Commission 
um, exactly uh, what action they're taking. One of those things you raised was charging residents an NDIS plan uh, separately for services that they already pay for in their SRS fees, such as cleaning and laundry. Yeah. And the provision of psych is it psych psychological support? Yeah. I don't... And community visitors aren't forensic investigators, right. so they're reporting on what they see and what they think is, is happening. They then report that to somebody that they hope will investigate, either the regulator or the Quality and Safeguarding Commission. So these are the things that they're told um, uh, <coughs> when they visit. It's up to uh, the person responsible or the body responsible to check the veracity of that. So these are what community visitors are told and they believe is happening. Um, and they're desperately telling people, you know, in reports to government, in letters yeah. um, that I signed to the Quality and Safeguarding Commission um, about what they believe is happening. Anyway, to go back to my original question, you've raised it with the Victorian government. Yes. And at the Commonwealth level, yes. the Quality and Safeguards Commission. Yes. Have you asked for right of entry powers for your office? Um, uh, on multiple occasions, uh, 2012, the Victorian Law Reform Commission did a review of the Guardianship Act and made recommendations about um, investigative powers and own motion powers that wasn't included in the latest um, Guardianship and Administration Act. The um, Australian Law Reform Commission um, in their elder abuse inquiry called for a review of adult safeguarding laws uh, and some states have acted on those, um, New South Wales and South Australia, but other governments such as Victoria haven't as yet. Um, have, has the government or successive governments given particular reasons for their reluctance to grant these powers? No. I see. In response to Commissioner Ryan's question, you raised the, uh, the, the absence of information sharing. So the information comes from your office to picking up the example, the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission, but you said that they are unable to share information back to you. Is it correct to say that community visitors don't form part of the NDIS Quality and Safeguarding Framework? Uh, yes, that's correct. And is that a, a subject upon which your office has made recommendations? Multiple times. Um, you know, I, I think the value of the Community Visitors Program has been demonstrated time and time and time again. And I cannot understand why it doesn't form part of the quality, uh, quality and safeguarding uh, framework. It, they, they should be. Um, and that's not for want of for want of trying. And uh, I, again, I don't understand um, why that isn't the case. But I do want to make a point about community visitors. Um, there is a very long history of what we call official visitors in older um, lunacy laws and in visiting institutions. And community visitors really arise out of that visiting of institutions. And community visitors have adapted to moving from, and they're instrumental in the closure of um, institutions in Victoria. And they then moved to the group home model. So now you're visiting multiple sites, but under um, the uh, NDIS, the rollout of the NDIS, there's now, um, we're aware of, uh, I think it is 250 houses, additional houses, and we just don't have the resources to visit those houses. Um, we just can't. So the community, the traditional uh, community visitor model really like the safeguarding system needs to adapt. So how can it visit all of this multiplicity of, of houses? Already we can't um, visit houses that we are entitled to visit. And then you've got these um, unregulated places where we are not entitled to visit. So uh, community visitors, the, pro the model itself needs to adapt. And I know community visitors are very worried about um, the fact that they can't go to houses that they are entitled to visit. So either there's got to be um, an expansion of resources or perhaps us rethinking the model like we rethink the safeguarding system as, um, as the, the landscape changes and evolves. 
You made a comment about the, the focus of the regulatory system and the regulators being on the conduct of proprietors and providers. And you, you noted that that was, wasn't a, a person-centred approach. What would you have, if you could change the regulatory focus, how would you suggest that be done? Yeah, look, um, regulation does focus on, as you've said, um, the service providers. Community visitors are there for the individual and they shouldn't be caught up in uh, changing their role so they do undertake any regulatory work. Their work is there to uh, be there primarily for the person um, and to listen to them and hear their stories and then to help tell their stories to anyone who would listen. So I think it has to go, uh, regulation has to go hand in hand with um, a system that allows uh, a focus on the individual. The problem is, of course, if you're not part of the same framework, then you don't have to be listened to. And just as the residents say, I wasn't listened to, I wasn't heard, community visitors who have been telling the stories about the appalling conditions of SRSs uh, to the regulator and to various levels of government feel that they have not been heard. And they feel very frustrated and uh, again, the word is angry because they do all of this work and they feel, what is the point? No one listens to me. So the stories of the people are not being heard. Um, and so the regulatory system does have to have that element of um, a person-centred approach. And perhaps that isn't necessarily the regulator, but it has to be part of a system and there has to be a way for the voices of people to be heard. And I think everybody has a right to have a voice and everybody has the right to be heard. And that is what we are not hearing and seeing in the regulatory system currently. What is, what's the benefit other than a saving of resources of having a scheme that is staffed by volunteers. I'm not for a moment disparaging the commitment or mm. skills of volunteers, yeah. but is there an advantage other than it saves somebody money to do it that way rather than have a paid team of people yeah. with appropriate powers to go in and report to the organisation of which they form yeah. part? That's, that's a very good question. And I think it goes to the model of community visitors and a model of uh, empowerment and inclusion. So, uh, as I said, community visitors evolve from the visiting of institutions to group homes. They often live in the area of the houses that they visit. They know people over the longer term. They're able to go at different times of the day or on the weekend. Um, and uh, they form friendships and relationships in a way that it aren't possible um, with paid employees. They uh, form part of the social capital um, of Victoria, I think, you know, they make an enormous contribution. Um, the model may not work in other states, but it has been uh, because of geographic distances and a lack of volunteering. But Victoria has a very strong and proud tradition of, of volunteers. And uh, they have formed part of the community of, um, of people who live uh, with disability in various housing options. And uh, the other thing is that uh, just because it's volunteer doesn't mean it's cheap. Uh, the recruiting, the training of volunteers, and, and I say that a person who comes and works as a volunteer for us has had substantial training um, in uh, disability related, mental health related issues. And when they leave, they take that knowledge into the community. They talk about, um, uh, you know, they have a greater understanding of disability. So it is a very powerful model um, that is uh, underfunded uh, and volunteers, they, they just can't do all of this work any longer. It's, 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 it's insufficient. So there needs to be a modelling. Um, as I said, it needs. we need to look at how do um, 
safeguarding frameworks adapt to the new model and we need to think uh, and rethink how do community visitors uh, operate in the new landscape. Does the cohort of volunteers that do this sort of work match the diversity of the people to whom they're in a sense acting? In other words, for example, yes. do the cohort of volunteers tend to be much older because they're more, reti more retired yes. people? therefore perhaps making it a little bit more difficult for them to relate to the younger people? Is, is that an issue? Uh, I don't think so. Um, we would have um, a certain proportion of people with uh, lived experience of disability who are part of the program, or they may um, be a, a parent who has a child with a disability. They're not allowed to visit any of the houses associated uh, with their child. So there is a significant proportion of people who have in one way or another lived experience with disability. And to say, can older people not relate to the needs of younger people? Well, I don't think that that is true. It would be true for some individuals. Depends upon whether they're, they're yes. grandchildren or Yes, and I think um, also we do get as, uh, uh, some young people join as volunteers because they're students and it's a way of getting experience yeah. um, and understanding more about um, where they might potentially want to work. Is this part uh, of practical training uh, for some courses, whether in psychology, social work, similar discipline? Uh, look, we, we have a range of... Um, people who are volunteers and some come with professional uh, backgrounds. Yeah, no, I meant is this form, is there a mechanism where the volunteer scheme can be linked with one of the university or tertiary courses uh, that students being trained for work that may involve them in uh, disability support and so forth so that they can yes. get some practical experience? Potentially, but we just don't have the resources you know, to, to, to do that. Um, it, it, that's a, a very good suggestion, but, you know, we, frankly, we run on the smell of an oily rag and there's so many stories and so many people we're fighting on, you know, every day on every front. Um, and, but we do do extensive in-house training for all our volunteers. Mm. All right, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Just one last topic I'd like to cover with you, Dr. Pearson. It's the issue of financial viability and the, we've heard some evidence about the need of the SRS sector to diversify, to find other revenue streams. And we've talked about the NDIS, so uh, we, can, we can pop that to one side. But are you able to share with the Royal Commission information you have about other revenue streams that some in the SRS sector are seeking to take advantage of? So if I just go back one step and say that the profile of residents probably hasn't changed very dramatically since the last SRS census, but what has changed is the service landscape, um, and that's the difference. So we've seen since the last um, SRS census in 2018 the full scheme rollout of um, the NDIS, so we've seen a significant increase in the number of people in SRSs who would have NDIS plans. There's um, increased accessibility of aged care home packages. And that both means that some people will stay at home and not go to SRSs, some older people. Um, but it does mean that some people may be able to age in place in places you know, where they've lived for some time. We've got um, the emergence of um, pop-up housing so um, whatever these forms of housing are that are associated with SRS and people are moved out of the SRS into um, the pop-up housing. And uh, absolutely horrifyingly, um, we have been told that two um, SRSs have registered and have had their, re their registration accepted to accept um, referrals from family violence services. So, uh, you know, that would into that volatile mix that you've heard about, um, you know, if they accept people um, escaping situations of family violence and, you know, potentially that might mean 
women and children in, in the environment. That would be uh, so appalling. Um, but I heard only last night about another example where a person providing um, short-term accommodation and medium-term accommodation is now seeking to be registered as an SRS. So you're seeing the diversification. So short-term accommodation, STA, is kind of the old respite funding. So um, you've got people moving in and out, potentially moving in and out of a service when you've got other people living there as long-term residents. Now they've applied for registration. Um, I don't know where they've got with that. So you've seen in order for these services to be viable, they've had to diversify their business model and to take advantage of opportunities um, that arise because of the changing landscape. And um, Brian Lipman said that, um, you know, where there is a failed system and there is a demand for services, so where there is market failure, then uh, businesses will take advantage of this. And there's certainly a demand for accommodation. Uh, and so uh, into that breach steps all of these new kinds of models um, of accommodation driven for profit. With the fragmented regulatory circumstance you've described. Yes. Those are my questions, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Dalsett. Uh, uh, in accordance with our customary practice, I'll ask my colleagues, if I may, if they have any questions to put to you, starting with Commissioner Galbally in Melbourne. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about the separation of service provision, it, say, if you have a package from NDIS, from the ownership of the property. Um, which has been much discussed in within a group home context. But would that be a helpful thought for some of these problems with SRSs, that you cannot provide services using an NDIS package if you're providing the property? Look, I think that would be uh, very helpful, but... Um, I talked about the sort of the, the, the labyrinth of, um, you know, service providers. And what you see is that um, directors being on um, directors of multiple yes. um, services. And so, um, so the SRS may not um, provide the service, but the, an associated company may in fact provide those services. So it becomes very difficult um, for people to sort out who is who is the provider and, and what is that relationship. Um, well, that would have to be regulated and would and if it was something that was required of group home service providers, it would have to be regulated, wouldn't it? Yes. And look, um, I've been into, not I, my office has been into uh, some of these pop-up accommodation when we've um, been the guardian and, you know, we are very concerned. The resident will say very typically, yes, I like it here because it's not an SRS. It's like three people. I only share the bathroom with three people. I get the meals um, that I want. Um, but it's a false choice. You know, it, it's not really a choice that they're able to make. They're being offered um, something that's potentially better than what they have, but then we don't know what's happening to their NDIS package, who's providing the services, what are they getting? Typically, they might say, oh, look, I don't know what's in my package. I don't know the quantum of, uh, of money, but yeah, look, I like it here, it's okay. Um, so uh, it's very difficult to understand. And I think you need some forensic accounting to have a look at some of these services to understand where the money is going um, for the service provision. And whether it's in the house that I mentioned, the SRS where the person said, I'm being charged $3,000 a month and the service isn't changing. You talk to people in the group home and, uh, sorry, in the pop-up accommodation and, you know, do you have 24 hour support? Oh, I, I, I don't know, yeah, there was somebody here. You know, that there's no way of knowing exactly what they're getting for their service. On another matter, the issue of people wandering in and out of an SRS, um, you know, we've heard about um, 
I think it was in Life Without Barriers with, you know, the, the problem of people not being able to come in and not getting informal eyes on what's going on as well as just friends and so not knowing who they are, there's a bit of a tension, isn't there, with that, per, you know, permeability mm. and um, the regula regulatory notion. Like you wouldn't want not to have people coming in and out. Yes, would you? yes. Uh, you certainly would want to have visits from support workers, family, friends. Uh, the difference is that SRSs really are... Um, a form of an institution. So you have large numbers of people living there and those that are providing professional support should have some form of um, identification that identifies them. Uh, you don't need to identify family and friends, um, but you do need to know who is coming into um, a facility and what the purpose of them being there is. Um, with the issue of community visitors, do you see schemes like citizens advocacy where the advocate can be with somebody for 20 years and is, you know, is quite close to them? Like it, it doesn't have a sort of interface with regulation, really. Mm. Um, do you see those sort of schemes as part of the continuum of all sorts of people, you know, circles of friends potentially, um, you know, informal volunteering programs of other kinds. Do you see them all on the same continuum? Or do you uh, see yes. com community visitors as having a much more official role and therefore separate? Mm. Look, I, I think all of those schemes are very important because they promote inclusion uh, and they promote... Um, the valuing of people with a disability who often talk about being friendless, not having a voice, not being heard. Um, and those kinds of schemes, uh, the citizens' advocacy or circles of support, build supports around those individuals so they feel they have a community, that they have friends, that they have someone who will listen to them and hear them and advocate uh, for them. And do you think they play a safeguarding role too in, in you know, a set of eyes watching things and being able to report? Do you hear from, um, at, you mentioned an advocate before that who'd contacted you? Uh, that was a paid advocacy service. Um, no, we don't. Uh, uh, my office hears all the horrible stories of abuse, neglect and exploitation and where you have circles of support um, or some form of citizens' advocacy, generally those people have the supports to enable them uh, to um, get the kinds of services and support that they need. And my office is at the other end where we hear the stories of where um, people, people uh, don't get the, the support that they need. Thank you. Commissioner Wright. Yeah, thank you. Um... Dr. Pierce, you've used the term um, pop-up housing. Mm. Um, perhaps we need a definition of that. Are you only referring to the sort of housing you were outlining at the beginning, or is there does that have yeah. a particular uh, definition in the? No, in the and it, it, it's a term that was uh, coined uh, potentially by my office, but I'm not sure. And that's because all of a sudden, out of the SRSs in the Wild West, we were seeing uh, new forms pop up. Um, so it had a term that was used in a, a particular time, but what we're seeing is a, a diversification of the housing market. Often they'll describe themselves as private rental. Um, and uh, if they're private rental, when you ask, well, what's the tenancy rights? Um, they kind of describe it for those of us who might have once lived in a, a share home as a kind of where a share home. And um, the tenancy uh, rights are extremely limited. That's why you see people moving in and out um, all of the time. And either we see complicated legal tenancy arrangements that I can't understand, or else it's a, you know, a, a few lines on a sheet of paper. So they, they don't have uh, tenancy rights. Um, and they are, uh, in my view, outside of the regulatory 
system until we find perhaps that they are. So what's driving that introduction in the market? Who's funding it? Are people just paying for it out of their own pocket or is it $350 or is it, a week? Or is it NDIS? Well, um, it, it depends if they're paying, um, if you've got uh, $350 to $500 a week, um, then uh, as I said, it's, it's a, 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 there's a market, there is a demand for housing. Um, and, you know, you, you don't get much change out of your pension, but if you cover the housing costs, to me, what's at risk is your NDIS plan, because the big dollars are in the NDIS plan, not in the accommodation. Yeah. So if you provide the accommodation, and that, you know, more or less covers it, but you have access to people's plans and you're uh, the support coordinator and um, providing the services or are through a complex web of interrelated companies, I mean, that's, that's potentially what I think is where the money is. So in all probability, these are somehow or other NDIS providers who've also, not only do they fall outside of the regulatory regime required for SRSs, they somehow or other are also very difficult to regulate in the way in which the NDI, NDIS um, regulates as well, are they? Well, because we don't know what's happening on the ground and to get a, to get the um, uh, Quality and Safeguard Commission to act, you need a complaint. And think of the people that have spoken here today. How are they going to, what are they going to say the complaint is? And how are they going to articulate that? And without um, advocacy um, or community visitors, how are they going to have their voices heard? And that's not a complaint about the Quality and Safeguarding Commission. It is just, as I said, this landscape is evolving quickly. Um, and how do we how do we develop models? If you're an NDIS provider, though, don't you have to accommodate, you know, a, a accord to a certain level of uh, supervision, a code of conduct, and so on? You do. So are these people avoiding that? Uh, well, I could. It would only be speculation because we don't know what's happening in the houses. Um, but if you don't know exactly what's happening, you can only speculate as to um, what what is what is happening. Um, you know, people can be moved into houses and they move again and they move again. So it's really hard to keep track of where people are going. Earlier in your evidence, you described, um, you explained what was meant by pre-Hamlin and post-Hamlin. Um, but it'd be fair to say, I think you said that the incidence of the COVID pandemic um, was kind of the trigger for which a significant amount of action got took, taken, which ultimately resulted in the closure yes. of Hamlin House and I think another. Um, SRS as well, would it be fair to say that you've had a stream of intelligence which would have given you strong reason to have um, taken strong regulatory action against Hamlin House and, say, Grace Manor long before the COVID pandemic revealed it? Indeed. It's, it's published in my annual reports. Right. So um, unless there's another COVID pandemic, we may... There might be a whole heap of other things. Look, I, I, I think uh, the regulator has shown that um, he is now willing to act and we are seeing firmer action from the regulator. And since the closure of Hamilton House, we've seen two other um, services close. Um, and there's other action that they're taking. Um, so, you know, there is, there is a change, definitely a change, and certainly a much more... Uh, cooperative relationship uh, and uh, with my office and a willingness to share information that wasn't there before and far more respect for the community visitors. Um, now, notwithstanding the fact that the Commission has this morning received evidence that suggests that some people appreciate the congregate atmosphere of SRSs, you've said that they really are institutions and you'd be aware of the fact that state governments around the nation over two or three decades have taken action to close institutions. Mm. Do you see a problem with, um, for example, um, the NDIS continuing to fund, um, uh, basically provide viability for what appear to be institutions? You've heard, you've heard um, evidence from some individuals today who um, do want to live 
in um, congregate care, um, those that number would be very small um, to find like-minded people who understand their issues. So is there a place for congregate care? Um, and the largest SRS has 80 people in it, um, you know, no. Um, but can communities uh, be, um, can you have a smaller scale um, uh, accommodation, but where you have the opportunity to have um, to, to form that community, because otherwise many people um, are living um, alone um, and we all have the choice about who we want to live with and some people do want to live alone and some people are very, very lonely um, living in those circumstances and want to live with like-minded people and they may not find that in three to five people. But um, once we start to get um, larger scale, then we start to get institutions and with that comes um, routine. So um, with routine comes all of you will eat your dinner at five o'clock tonight. The lights will go out, the doors will close. So you start to get institutionalised uh, behaviour um, and more importantly, you get staffing that is institutionalised. And I honestly wonder with the regulator, you saw the, you saw the Hamilton House photos, mm. uh, how could you go in there and not see what community visitors saw unless you had some form of institutionalised thinking? But you would think that that is okay or that that is compliant. So you get institutionalised thinking um, that has a detrimental effect um, on the individual and goes against their ability to uh, make uh, choices, uh, real choices, and to control their circumstances. So you've got to weigh that up, uh, the institutions against a, a desire for some people to live um, in larger settings um, where they can share their experiences. How do we mitigate then between those two competing requirements mm. of people wanting the fellowship of a congregate setting mm. and ensuring that it doesn't become a segregated, institutionalised environment in which people who probably, some people who can't speak up for themselves mm. uh, become trapped? Look, I, I think Winteringham provides some really interesting examples of that in the work they do with um, uh, in aged care uh, settings. And, um, you know, I'll just give you an example. I have uh, doing some advocacy for a person in um, Geelong. They live by themselves. They're terribly lonely, afraid to go out. Of, uh, and wander the street because they're scared of dogs. Um, we've talked about them going to um, a Winteringham facility where there are a number of um, houses, you, you live on your own, but a number of them are clustered together and there's a communal space where there is, you, you, you have your own lounge room, but where there's arts and crafts, there's support, there's a range of things that occur there. So they live uh, in a setting and He's so desperate to get there because he says it's just the kind of place he's a drinker, you know, uh, has been. Um, and uh, there's people who've had that kind of experience that uh, understand his circumstances. So I think Winteringham does give us some examples um, of where they've been able to achieve that. Is that the kind of thing that we would want to see on large scale? Absolutely not. Um, and uh, Winteringham has very rigorous, uh, adheres to very rigorous um, accreditation standards. Um, so <coughs> the number of people that would want that would be very, very small. We're talking about a small number of people. And the more we give people choice and control and we support them to make their own decisions, they may choose not to be in congregate care settings, but may be willing and want to go elsewhere, but they don't know what the opportunities are. But equally, they may choose to go to congregated settings if that is a genuine exercise of choice and control, accepting 
This is an area where many phrases are used, but they are prepared to accept the dignity of risk associated with it. Your point is that it may be very small, but there are some people who might be suited to that and might exercise and, and if it was choice. And if it was small scale, hmm. you know, nothing like these large uh, facilities. So, and, it, if it, and if it was properly run and regulated. And, and um, uh, so I'm a bit torn because, yes, I agree with you. I'm very concerned about a model being exploited where we go against everything we've been fighting for, for small scale living. Um, not many of us would want to live in a house with six others. There are, there are actually quite difficult dilemmas here. Yes, yes. <laughs> which, yes. which your examples are exposing, I think. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. Can I ask a, just a specific question? A, a registered SRS, can that same entity be a registered NDIS provider? Uh, my understanding is yes, but the Quality and Safeguarding Commission perhaps could answer that correctly. So you, you don't know whether the same criteria apply or whether each organisation uh, shares information to enable uniform decisions to be made? No, I don't know the extent to which they share that, that, that information. All right. Thank you very much. Chair, could I interrupt just yes. for one moment, just to, um, just to make sure there was a question asked by Commissioner Ryan of the witness. Commissioner Ryan, you asked the question, do you see a problem with, for example, the NDIS continuing to fund, basically provide viability for what appears to be institutions? I just wanted to flag, Commissioner Ryan, that the NDIS doesn't fund the institution the NDIS funds providers, and it doesn't fund accommodation, it funds support around a registered participant. Well, it doesn't necessarily fund providers either. It funds participants who may thank fund you. providers. Thank you very much, yeah. that's right. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I think, thank you for pointing that out. Thank you. And could I, could I please just make one other uh, comment just around going back to that, that difficult issue about, you know, congregate care and say that SRSs are really um, last resort um, and they have not been able to uh, provide or the, the, um, uh, the environment for um, NDIS participants to um, take full advantage of what the NDIS would offer. So when we're talking about congregate care, I'm talking about something that is not an SRS, uh, which is, you no, know- we under, I think we've understood that very clearly. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. thank you, Chair. All right, well, thank you very much, Dr. Pierce, again, for coming to the Royal Commission. Once again, your evidence is very helpful and thought provoking. We uh, appreciate your contributions to the Royal Commission. So thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes the evidence for today, Chair. We, I propose that we adjourn now and resume at 9.30 tomorrow morning. 9.30 tomorrow. Yes. Very well, 9.30 tomorrow. We'll adjourn. The Royal Commission is adjourned.